Um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. It is January 24th, uh, 2022. It's 1101 and we're going to call this meeting to order. Um, just a few administrative details before we get started. Um, you know, a reminder that Mondays at 11 is our new official meeting time. Um, we're going to be adopting a regular meeting schedule in a few minutes that lays out the dates of our regular meetings, um, including our after hour public comment meetings through the end of May. Um, we may need to add some special or emergency meetings in between these regular meetings, but we'll do our best to give the public as much notice as possible before we do those. Do that. Um, given the continued spread of COVID in Vermont, the legislature and the governor uh, passed Act 78, um, which suspends the physical location requirement for open meetings. So until further notice, our meetings um, will no longer include an in-person participation, um, though we will, of course, continue to live stream the meetings um, so that members of the public can participate electronically or by phone. Um, and we'll continue to record them and post them. Um, so uh, please um, feel free to participate that way. And of course, our public comment portal is always open. Um, just looking at the week ahead, um, we're going to begin reviewing public comments on rules one and two today. Um, I expect that we might not get through all of the comments that we've received. Uh, we'll see how far we get, but we may need to schedule a follow up meeting for Thursday. Um, we uh, have our regular after hours public comment uh, meeting tomorrow evening from six to seven, um, which will be live streamed. So please join um, that. And then also later this week on Thursday, we're going to have our first social equity and economic empowerment networking event um, starting at five o'clock. And Julie, did you want to say anything else about that? Um, sure. The first one is it'll it'll be remote as well, so we won't have an in-person. Um, we had talked about doing it this hybrid, but given that we're um, changing kind of how we're doing things as a board, that will be uh, fully remote as well. Um, we have three folks coming, one experienced business person who's been through the permitting process recently, um, a regional planner, and then a, a person from a, a local city who is a planner. Um, and the, the goal is to talk about how to build relationships with your local government and navigate the permitting process. Great. Um, I don't have any other announcements. Um, so I guess uh, has everyone had a chance to look at the minutes from uh, January 18th? Yes. Yes. I think our motion to approve the minutes from January 18th. Someone? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, so next, I'd like to um, just adopt a regular meeting schedule, and I just created a document that we can all just kind of look at quickly. Um, Kyle, if you could pass me the HDMI. No, not gonna. You can move it. It's fine. Control things from here. Sorry. Nothing fancy about this, but here it's better for <laughs> us to just. I'll be on the same page here. OK, so not including today, um, but our next these are all Mondays um, unless otherwise noted. And um, I also have the kind of public comment meetings. Included. And we did um, we did Mondays, and we only went through the end of May for now, um, just because uh, when the hopefully the legislature will return at some point um, in June, um, and we can kind of reevaluate whether Mondays are working for us, um, if they're working for members of the public, and if we need to adjust. But this is kind of the basic. Most Mondays meetings, um, unless otherwise noted on an agenda, will begin at 11. Um, you know, just a note about the board suspending in person meeting attendance until further notice. Um, a reminder that people can always access our meetings um, via our link or 
by the phone. And um, we will record and post our meetings unless um, some sort of unusual circumstance prevents us from doing so. So um, does this look OK to everyone here? Okay. Yes. February right. 28th is town meeting week. I don't know if you wanted to take that week off. Oh, OK. Up to you, of course. What do we think? We take a week off. And we may need to schedule a special meeting, but as far as a regular meeting, maybe we should just take that off. Yeah. All right. So with that one edit, um, I take a motion to approve this schedule. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Great. All right. So we'll maybe post this to our website with that edit. All right. Oh, let me see. Next on the agenda um, is really to just review the public comments on one and two. Um, we received a huge amount of comments. Um, they range from being very uh, general to being very specific. Uh, David has organized them for us. Um, he's going to help us get through them systematically. Again, I think this will likely take longer than the three and a half hours that we have scheduled um, on our agenda. So um, if that is the case, we'll see how far we get today, but we may need to call a special meeting on Thursday. Um, so other than that, I'll just hand it over to you, David. Sounds good. All right, so we are going to go through the comments, I think. What we'll do is, uh, and just so folks know, let me back up for a second. So you all know, I think you do know, and the um, and the public knows, we do have all of the comments. All of the substantive comments are there. We did, and we where there were multiple comments on the exact same subject, we're not going to repeat them. This is just a summary of each of the substantive comments that were made, which are many, even without the without any repeats. Um, and for those who may be listening for their own comments, who that are in here. Um, the way we say them in the meeting may be a shortened version of what you wrote, but I do believe we uh, substantively uh, put in the key ideas. And of course, the board has either heard your comments for those of you who gave them in person or has read them, um, all of them, for those who submitted them in writing. The board reviews those as they come in at least every week, if not more. So everything's been seen in full. And what we're doing here is a little bit of a um, summary in some ways, but it's still a very complete set of uh, of the comments in terms of all substantive comments are here. So with that explanation, I'll dive in. As Chair Pepper mentioned, these do range from the general to the specific, and the earliest ones are very general, and they kind of are applicable to everything, which means that I'm not sure you're going to be able to make any decisions on them uh, specifically, but more just for you to keep in mind as we go through the rules and potentially make adjustments in accordance. Uh, and on some of these, I may have some comments myself just in terms of how the drafting went and things like that to give you context and give everybody context as we're thinking about that. First comment. Uh, for you, you just pause quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, there are potential areas that might lead to litigation, I think, um, or we might, might need David's kind of confidential attorney client advice. Um, and so I think, David, if you could note those areas for us as we go through, and I think we should have potentially, if needed, an executive session at the end of the meeting, um, you know, towards the end of the meeting, at least not kind of, you know, ad hoc as we go. That makes sense. We'll. One of us will keep a note of where we think those come up and we can tackle them in executive session if the board votes to do that. So uh, at the outset here, we've got the following comment. For ease of administration and the regulated community, it would be helpful to include all terms defined in statute in the rule. And if the statute guides the regulated community in some way, advertising, packaging, et cetera, it would be helpful to have directly included in the rule. We'll uh, make a comment on this. Um, I basically agree with this comment, but it was a considered decision not to include the all the statutory language in the rule because we anticipate that these statutes are going to change. They're probably going to change 
this legislative session and they will probably change again in future legislative sessions and part of the reason not to include the statutes the statutory language in the rule was that we would have a rule that would immediately or very rapidly be wrong which we don't want to have and ultimately we thought it would be less confusing for people to have rules that required them to go to the statutes to know everything as opposed to having rules that in some places were simply incorrect and then they'd have to figure out where they're incorrect and then go to the statutes and sort of do a matching game which ultimately is even more confusing so that was the idea behind that that was sort of the drafting decision behind that i think we'll make every effort to make the if you agree with going forward in that manner we'll certainly make every effort to make the statutes very readily available right alongside the rules, do the best we can to make it accessible and easy for people. And maybe in future years, as the sort of statutory change slows down, we can reconsider how the rules are constructed. But for now, that was the idea, is that ultimately having conflicting statutes and rules is worse than making people go to the statute to find stuff. So I'm fine with uh, the approach that we've taken, mm -hmm. as opposed to adding all the statutory yeah, me too. And I think we can start pivoting towards guidance and FAQs once we kind of have a better understanding of the finalization process of these rules. The next, do you have a very general comment applicable to everything or applicable generally is that regulations that are outside of the jurisdiction of the CCB may not be suitable for inclusion in the rule uh, when the CCB does not have the ability to enforce that other jurisdiction's law, statute, or rule. This could change if the CCB uses compliance with other laws as a basis for revoking a license or as a barrier to obtaining a license, but this should be outlined explicitly. And I'll just say here, it certainly is the case that CCB doesn't have the jurisdiction to enforce anybody else's rules, but there actually are places in the rules where you have conditioned, uh, compli uh, conditioned compliance and potentially violations on people following other entities' rules. So even though we couldn't step into the what regulatory role of another agency, um, it is possible that you could say, hey, you know, we know you're not following these other rules. And for that reason, you're out of compliance with our rules as well and can violate them potentially, or at least work with them to uh, come into compliance. Um, and so that I think is present in the rule. And that's why we do sometimes reference uh, entities rules. If there are no comments, I'll keep rolling no, through these general that ones. Me. Yeah, okay. me too. Uh, from our friends at the Department of uh, Agriculture, Food and Markets noted that uh, reporting to the board or requiring giving information to the board should generally only be required when it may trigger some action by the board. Otherwise, reporting or the requirements to report is burdensome for both the board and licensee without serving a purpose. Again, I don't think there's any response needed to this in general, but just something to keep in mind as we go through the rules and think about what's being asked of licensees. Um, here's another general rule of comment. Unless you're coming from the illicit market, having already paid for your, for your gross space and your equipment without the additional fees and expenses associated with the legal market, starting a legal indoor cannabis business as a tier one cultivator is not a profit-making enterprise. I suggest including tier two cultivators in the licensing and regulatory exemptions to make a fair and equitable marketplace for all small cultivators, not just the legacy growers who already have a significant head start in their startup costs, customer-based customer, customer -based genetics, et cetera. Um, again, that's sort of a broad comment, but, um, and as the board knows, you have a specific statutory requirement to lower the regulatory burden on tier one cultivators you don't have that for tier two and that's sort of the direction you've gone in but i don't know if folks have further comment on that you're welcome to so i mean we have the discretion though to tailor um regulations to for tier two cultivators right I mean, yeah i, I, I think that's right requirement to waive things for tier one so maybe we can just keep that in the back of our minds as we're you know once again fine-tuning these rules yeah, makes sense. I think, again, even some of the language, like it's not profitable, it's not a profit making enterprise. You can appreciate that and how year one, a lot of those startup costs might outweigh what you can gross, you know, or net, you know what I mean? But I think over time, that would even out a little bit regardless of what we do. 
Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And efficiency Vermont just is always keeping the back of our heads does have some incredible rebate programs uh, that um, something to keep in the back of our minds. Mm -hmm. Anyways. So moving not yet to super specific, but slightly more specific, uh, a comment on that is really focused on rule one on the licensing process says the following. I envision the following business for cannabis, growing a small number of plants, less than 50 processing on site and selling direct to consumer uh, through, our, through our existing network of contacts. However, under the proposed rule, I'd have to apply for three licenses. Uh, cultivator, manufacturer, and retailer. I'd hope that the board would provide an efficient and easy method for someone like me to apply and not require performing the same tasks three times. And in some ways, that's an operational comment, but something we can consider, I suppose. I don't know if you have other comment on, on that. You know, the way that I see this is that there's a lot of overlap between what's required in the various applications for these. You know, it's not like filling out three applications means that, you know, it's like three times the work, you know, you fill out one application and a lot of the same information would be required in all three. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually don't think it's overly burdensome uh, for someone to seek three applications, um, considering they're generally contain a lot of the same information. This business type would require, um, you know, of course, a cultivation license and a you know, tier two uh, product manufacturing license in a potentially, you know, a tier one retail license. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think we should get into the work of combining license types into a single license type at this stage. No, I think this could be addressed in whatever system we use for an application. If it can save portions of your application right. and carry it over, then that's that's probably the easiest way to address this. Yeah, I agree. I, I think let's let's see how well that that works over the course of a, this first phase of our program. And perhaps if we recognize that it's a little bit more of a burden than we perhaps anticipate, potentially see if we can look at a different license type that kind of combines certain individual license type next session or thereafter. So now jumping to the super specific, we looking at the definition section, rule 1.1.3, there is a recommendation that we define employee, which is, and this is relevant to section uh, 1.4.9 of the rule, um, which is the uh, social equity criteria, social equity criteria, technology we use there, but um, uh, sorry, positive impact criteria section. So, so the definition of employee would impact uh, the requirements for the positive impact criteria section. So anyway, that is the comment is to define employee, which, uh, and that was the extent of the comment. I'll say that from the lawyer standpoint, there are definitions of employee elsewhere in Vermont statute that we can, if this is something you wanna do, that we can copy pretty easily and just use what's already known. Um, as the definition in other business uh, practices. So yes, I think we should define employee. Yeah. And using what already exists in Vermont statute, like healthcare benefits and earned sick time and paid leave, et cetera, I think is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Like a full-time equivalency type of? Not quite. Um, so 32 VSA, I wrote it down. 10502 talks about it's the same definition as uh, employee for the purposes of health insurance, requiring yeah. to provide health insurance. That might be the one that fits this industry the best. Yeah, but fun. there are a lot yeah. of them. I want to make sure folks that only need more help at a certain time of the year don't get caught yeah. up in some unintended consequences. That definition defines seasonal versus kind okay. of a full time year. All right, sounds good. The next comment, comments really, there's a few comments on this about um, subsections B and F, which are the indoor versus outdoor cultivation definitions. And one comment says, these indoor outdoor cultivation definitions leave some confusion as to where hoop houses would fit 
the board could delineate the difference between indoor and outdoor cultivation by clarifying that outdoor cultivators may use an enclosing structure like a hoop house, which does not otherwise constitute a greenhouse under rule two, so long as they do not use artificial lighting. And then I'll also just do the next comment because it's somewhat relevant here. Uh, as noted below in 1.3.1, this may be a place to accommodate mixed light growing if the board chooses to do it. Um, so, yeah, and then somebody else notes that uh, indoor outdoor definition does not contemplate greenhouse buildings that don't use artificial light, basically the same comment. So, clarifying the indoor outdoor cultivation definitions is what we're getting at here. Potentially, if I think we could come back in a few minutes to the mixed light growing issue, which might make more sense to address when we talk about the cultivation tiers. Okay. We defined indoor outdoor by the type of light, right? right? We define indoor by <clears throat> growing cannabis using artificial light. I know we've heard a lot about mixed light. I know, you know some folks need some artificial light to prevent their flowers from flowering too early or their cannabis plants from flowering too early. I mean, I think I would certainly want to consider a very small amount of artificial light that outdoor growers could use, a kilowatts per uh, usually kilowatts per square foot. Um, other states do this. I, I don't think we want to create a new tier at this point in the system, but I think allowing a very small amount of artificial light for outdoor growers makes makes sense here. And would that be for any plants or would that be for like plants that are not yet nearing maturity, like clones that are just starting? I think it'd be for any plants. I do think, and maybe this is just more education that we need to or guidance that we need to put out, but it was our intent to, or at least mine, or the sustainability committee, their intent to make sure that hoop houses were considered outdoor through that not in use for cannabis production over 180 days. They're more of your temporary style greenhouses. So those, it's my understanding, are considered outdoor. So I think we just need to clarify that a little bit. What kind of clarification do we need there, though? To me, it seems pretty clear already. Me too, but you know, whether that's guidance or, you know. I, so I do think that the outdoor cultivation definition needs to be altered slightly to make it clear that hoop houses could be included in it. And I don't think that's hard to do. I think right. to say that it outdoor could include an enclosing structure, it doesn't use artificial lighting, and then it can do the next light thing. We'll add another clause that says that uh, outdoor cultivation could also include X type of um, lighting under a certain amount, whatever that ends up being. Right. Does that also mean a greenhouse that uses natural sunlight is outdoor growing? Interpretation. Yeah. And we'll check on rule two to make sure our greenhouse definition doesn't accidentally have any conflicts, but we'll, we can iron that out. All right, so I'm taking the decision there as we will clarify that Outdoor cultivation can include hoop houses. We have at least one movement towards mixed light growing, but let's like close that conversation when we get to the tier, if that's okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the um, next comment is about social equity criteria. There are two comments here. One has to do with ownership structures. Uh, and whether um, a certain se certain sections of the Code of Federal Regulations, which are definition references, should be carved out in order to make it easier to do capital raising activities for business owners. And the second one is really about what qualifying groups should be included in the definition. So um, let's take let's do the first one first. I think we can discuss that, and we'll tackle the second one after that, or at least address it, initially address it after that. Um, so the 51% ownership rule, a commenter points out that, uh, and I'll, I'll read through this, I think that'll be easier than my trying to summarize it. By virtue of the reference to the federal disadvantaged business enterprises definition, rule one requires not only that an entity be at least 51% owned by socially disadvantaged individuals, but that they own at least 51% of each class of interests in the enterprise. This would create an unnecessary hurdle to efficient capital raising as they would not be able to utilize common private equity investment structures, which give investors preferred shares 
um, which serve to give investors typical rights like liquidation preferences, co-sale rights, anti-dilution rights, and the like, while founders retain common shares. Instead, uh, socially disadvantaged individuals and their funders will be forced to structure their investment documents in less typical ways, which will only serve to increase their lawyers' fees. So the recommendation, the commenter's recommendation here is to carve out the requirements of a certain set of subparts of the Code of Federal Regulations while retaining another set of subparts um, that sort of ensures the majority interest requirement. In other words, that the socially disadvantaged individual does in fact retain majority interest in a certain level of control. So I'll sort of make a couple comments on this from the lawyer standpoint. I think that this is a valid point in that the way the Code of Federal Regulations is structured, it would make it more difficult uh, for venture capital money specifically to come into an enterprise like this. It, it's not impossible, but it would require unusual structuring to do. Um, and so it does sort of close that off a little bit. The counter to that is that, or I would I would say the counter to that is that when you do allow those types of structures to come in, there is going to be some inherent tension in terms of what control means so that it would remain the case under this type of structure where there's venture capital money coming in that the person who's actually running the business still has a tremendous amount of control over the business and sort of daily business operations but venture capitalists don't put money in them having any say they will have some sort of veto power over uh, certain decisions that might be made around the structure of the business around changing bylaws things like that that's usually how those sorts of funding um, streams get structured. So I certainly think this is something you could do. I think it will make it easier to raise venture capital. I think that there will be a little bit more tension between the control, the actual control and um, what the VCs control. That's not to say I don't think we can do it. I think what'll, what that'll mean is it'll be a little bit harder, frankly, for the board to assess control when we're looking at this. One of the benefits of the way it is now is that it's very easy for the board to just say, do you have 51% of all these type of, of this whole pool of potential equity? Yes, great. And that's not the whole story, of course. There could be other clever structurings that happen that effectively undermine that. But it is a, a fairly straightforward check mark. It becomes less straightforward when you have something like this, because then you have to start looking at the documents and seeing what sort of control the socially disadvantaged individual actually has retained under the various funding rights. But that's not impossible to do by any means. It can be done. And I think there is a sort of reasonable assessment that can be made uh, to say, all right, you know, there's this is a normal VC funding round and the conditions are normal and the person is still retaining all, all the sort of general ways in which we'd say, they retain control of the business. They've gotten this money, there's some conditions attached to it, but they're basically making all the business decisions and retain the benefits of ownership. So that was a little bit long-winded in part because this stuff is very complicated. Um, and I would say, I think the point made by the commenter is fair. I think it does put a little bit more onus on the board and the board staff to figure out exactly what's really going on, but that it would open uh, funding streams at a lower cost, whereas the current rule would require some very creative, probably lawyering to get funding streams in. And if we were to do this, is there are there other places in the rule that we need to amend for the types of documents that we get or the type of information we get from the applicant? I think that we already had, there were actually, there are some comments on the yep. disclosure requirements that we're going to get to. I actually do think our disclosure requirements are very robust already and allow us to get at a lot of the information. But when we get to those sections, we can look and see if we would need to. I, I think we can get all the information we need already, though, okay. even if we were to, to do that. So, yeah, this, um, you know, we want, we know that access to capital is the most difficult piece of starting one of these businesses, but we also don't want these predatory relationships to develop. I'm fine with um, accepting the recommendation here because I really think that um, 
you know, people are just not going to invest in this industry if they if they have to change the way that they're used to mm-hmm. investing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think people do go into those situations with their eyes wide open about what they're si- signing into. Um, you know, it, it happens in the VCs exist in every industry. And um, I think people just need to really be clear about the contracts that they're signing. Um, so I'm fine with accepting the recommendation here. Sounds great. Everybody's on. All right. Yep. So the, the next one, I'll, um, I'm going to read it out loud and then I'll have a, a comment on it. This is about the qualifying groups, which uh, is not a, in the text of the rule, but is effectively in the rule by reference, as we um, note in uh, section A, sub, subsection K of this section of the rule, 1.1.3. So under the current definition, the qualifying groups would include women, Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Americans, subcontinent Asian Americans, or other minorities found to be disadvantaged by the um, uh, Small Business Association, which is a federal entity. And then the comment is basically that the board may want to consider this. Um, this is not exactly what the board's recommendation had been uh, not recommendation, your because you were adopting a um, a socially disadvantaged individual definition, or I should say, a social equity applicant definition. And so, this is a comment to, about revisiting this, given how the rules kind of worked out. Um, and there's a number of other comments on this issue, and um, I'll read through those as well. One commenter says, can you please define what constitutes a community in the social equity definitions? Uh, And that's specifically down in uh, subsection L, I believe. Um, Another comment says, it is my understanding that the advisory board recommended that the control board remove women. This commenter is referencing the CCB's uh, advisory board. Um, The advisory board recommended that this board remove women from the social equity guidelines in Vermont. And just to clarify what happened there, it wasn't so much a removal. It was that your original proposal was really focused on uh, people of color. Uh, So it wasn't so much a removal. We're just talking about making the federal guidelines fit the board's proposal here. Um, The commenter says that women are included, which is true in this, under this rubric and the federal rubric, there's language throughout the regulations and licensing that state, uh, that states women are disproportionately affected. Female CEOs in the cannabis industry are declining, not increasing as the business, as the business grows. They are increasingly taken over by large corporate, predominantly male boards. Uh, females historically work harder to be heard and respected and taken seriously in this industry and in the business world in general. Until these numbers change, I believe females should be part of the social equity conversation in Vermont as it is federally. Uh, two more comments that will go through and then discuss this as a whole. The uh, 1.3.1J, somebody has a technical correction, which I always appreciate. And is cor- I will just note, I think they are right. The of was supposed to be an or. You are right. Thank you. Um, and then the final one notes adding a state residency requirement. And there, and I will just say, I, it's understandable why this might be missed because it's it's basically at the bottom and it's in a different subsection. But there is actually a requirement for this that the people are currently residents of Vermont. There's no requirement that they have resided here over us any length of time, but just that at the application time they are residents of Vermont. So one thing I'll just note is that. Um, board is free to discuss whatever pieces of this they want. Uh, If the board would like my advice as your attorney with respect to um, uh, who the the definitions of socially disadvantaged individuals should should include, a social equity business applicant should include, I would recommend to the board that you take that as professional legal advice and also Given what has happened in other states, the likelihood of litigation, I would recommend that the board hear my advice on that piece in executive session. Of course, that's up to you. But um, that would be my recommendation if you want me to weigh in on uh, specifically which uh, the sort of group definitions. 
and um, again, for the reasons I just stated, but you're welcome to discuss as much or as little as you want and then do executive session later. I leave that up to you all. I say um, my advice would be we hear from David in executive session and then um, get his advice and then, you know, come back and um, kind of come back and have a decision um, outside of executive session. Mm -hmm. Agree. Yep. Agreed. That sounds good. And I will just remind folks listening that board can can have executive sessions, but can't make any final decisions in executive sessions. So you will hear what any decisions um, they will be made in public. Um, so we're skipping now to 1.3 license tiers. And this comment I put here, but it kind of could apply potentially in the renewal section too. We'll just see where you guys land on this, but it's a comment saying that the board should provide clarity around how a licensee can move between tiers. Can they do it at renewal? Could they do it in the middle of the licensing year? Uh, what would you like the parameters to be? Uh, we don't have any sort of explicit provisions on that yet. What would you like the parameters to be on moving between tiers? So um, Massachusetts, uh, you know, has a kind of change of tier request application. Um, they get pretty specific. They, you know, you have to um, demonstrate that you're cultivating at the top of your production tier and that you've sold 85% of your product consistently over the preceding six months. Um, I don't know if we need to get that prescriptive on this. Um, obviously, you can't hold two license two licenses of the same type simultaneously so in thinking about this we need to think about you know how does someone expand particularly if they're changing locations i think because you know you're going to have to wind down one operation and then wind up another but you can't own two licenses simultaneously so um seems to me like we we could either have a fixed period where people can change their licenses like after six months um, or they could do it as needed at their kind of at their request. And I think that's one decision point we should make. And the other one should be kind of is there an overlap where you're allowed to kind of wind down one operation and start up another um, kind of operate under both at the same time. So on your first point, I'm thinking allowing people to do it whenever it makes business sense for them. Yep. Um, like some sort of mid-year amendment that they make to their license. And then I wonder if the grace period is until their next license application. So if you were to scale up, for example, you would apply for some sort of amendment and then you'd have to apply for the new type of license. Then you apply for your net when you apply for renewal. You just pay the difference in the licensing fee at the point with which you make the amendment. I think we could do it that way. I do like the mass requirement of proving that you've sold over 85 percent of the product you've grown. I think yeah. if we don't include something like that, it's really going to mess with our supply demand models because we're then giving a higher tier of a license to somebody who, you know, we might end up in an oversupply situation or an anticipated one, which could just really, I think, impact some of how we make decisions. And then on the other side, for scaling down, we want to know what happened with the product that they're scaling down from, right? So if they were growing 25 square feet, you want to grow less. We want to know what happened with. We would have. We would know actually through the tracking system. So people can change, graduate at any point, but they have to file a new application. That I'm hearing. A supplemental or an amendment yeah, an to their amendment. existing amendment. license. Okay. Pay the difference. Pay the difference. So I'm trying to I'm trying to work this out in my head. Like if you get licensed and in day two we go out and inspect, we've spent all the money that we are I mean we've we've incurred the cost of what your license is intended to cover. So to me I'm not really sure that there should be any kind of proration or any sort of um refund for the existing license that you that you saw it. Um, that's the part where I'm getting caught up. So it seems to me like what you should have is you could allow people to graduate at any point, but they just have to kind of 
apply anew, essentially, to pay the fee. Um, and that's kind of just the cost of doing business. I mean, there's nothing that's forcing people to upgrade mid year, you know. Or, so um, to me, I think it's just a new application, um, new license. I mean, again, the application, you can probably upload a lot of the same documents that you applied for the first one. I don't think it's overly onerous to require just a new application and a new fee, you know, at the discretion of the person. You know when when they're ready to do it, uh, and then and then as far as whether they can operate under both at once, I mean maybe there's some sort of sixty or you know if if you're changing if you're not changing locations, there's no reason why the one can't be revoked the second the new one or rescinded the right. second the new one takes effect. If you're just expanding your canopy in your existing kind of facility. Um, you are changing locations. I could see how there might be some kind of time where you need both operations going simultaneously. How do you feel about the proving that you've sold over a certain percentage of your product in order to to graduate? You know, it it makes sense. Obviously, uh, you know, it it helps us uh, from a supply demand perspective. But I w I wonder if we really need it. I mean, well, to the extent of making this overly complicated, which easy to do what if we what if we said if you can prove to us you've you've accommodated for over 85 percent of your product and at that point you get prorated if you choose not to certify that you've gotten over 85 percent of your product sold in a demonstrated way it's a whole new application but we already have that information though in the seed to sale tracking system like that is just sold I, we already have that we have somebody to crunch the data for us <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying to get creative here. I mean, if we require the 85% to graduate, it kind of leads me down the path of are we going to claw back unused campaign? Right. right. I mean, it seems like two sides of the same coin. Like, are we going to require? I'm not opposed to doing that either, but you know, I'm not tied to it either. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. I don't know if I have a clear path in my head on the best way at this point in time. Just trying to think from a practical standpoint, how much staff do we have to really, you know, go out and re to, to evaluate all these, yeah. like, you know, decision points. I mean, Massachusetts has over 120 people working for them. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I, I understand the the value of this kind of thing, and, and maybe the. Maybe the graduating is more important um, than the kind of coming back to know that people are actually operating at full capacity, so they're not overextending themselves. But it, at the same time, it kind of feels a little nanny state ish, like we're, we're saying, oh, you know, you have to demonstrate that you can actually do this in order to do it. It's not like very free market of us, but. Yeah, no, I agree. It's just at that point, yeah. Okay, yes. If if it's data that we would already have, I would rather not require the licensees to collect duplicate information to provide to us. So assuming that that's data that we have in our C to sale tracking system and what we need is staff to look at it, then that's a different. Well, would, a, would a better way to look at it be like prove to us that you've got the existing relationships and potential future contracts? To the extent that we can require that. To we wouldn't require that of just someone who's coming in fresh. I know, I know. Well, yeah, we do though. Their business plan would, rec I mean, they would put all that in their business plan. So, um, if you're applying a new, which in my mind sounds, it sounds onerous, but it depends on kind of what our system looks like, right? If we can re-upload the same documents or use documents that are already saved in the system, maybe it's not so bad. But we would have all that information about if they're applying a new, we would have all the information about, you know, their financing and. What they have to support the growth of their business right but so but i'm just saying that we wouldn't necessarily if someone was applying anew we wouldn't say you need to have i mean it seems like we're adding a requirement for someone who's already has a track record that does not apply to someone who's applying for the first time yeah no, i know i agree with that i was just trying to think of if somebody's asking us to pivot their license midway through, 
there may be a reasoning to looking as to more of the why, you know. But again, but if, but if they're just going to apply for a new, like you're a thousand square foot cultivator and you're applying mid year for a 2500 license, we're going to get all the same materials. So I don't think we need a requirement necessarily that they have this 85% sold. We're going to see it anyway. Right. We, well, that jump scares me for different reasons because there's so many carve outs for small cultivators yeah. that we're going to need to double check regardless. But that's a separate conversation. Well, then they would, I mean, they would have to apply a new, right? Because yeah. they're, going to have to meet new requirements. Yeah. All right, so I don't know where we are. <laughs> um, I think we're at well, not then. not doing the 85. proving 85 percent and applying a new. That's that's where I'm at. OK, yeah. cool. That. I mean, the only thing about having a fixed date when like a mid year review or something like that is it makes our lives a little bit more predictable our compliance yeah. folks a little bit more predictable. Like we're not going to have to necessarily review applications. I mean, we're going to have to review applications on a rolling basis, but we're not going to have to re review renewal or upgrade applications, graduation applications kind of, you know, on a rolling basis. It'll all be at a set time. I feel like once the market's matured a little, it's easier to set that date. Right. Like we right. might know better like when in the year that makes sense. Yeah. So early on, more flexibility, maybe revisit this in a year. Right. Seem right? Yep. That sounds good. Uh, the only piece that I didn't hear a conclusion on is like the transition period. If somebody's granted a license, do you have a new license that's a different tier or potentially, I guess, even different type? Is there a transition period or 60 day? Sure. 60 day overlap. That's good. Yep. That failed on my second pen of the day, so I'm going to get a new one. All right. So now we are going on. I'll, I'll wait for 10 seconds here while Kyle will come back. <laughs> is there a reason not to do that or to not allow like someone who has a 25,000 square foot? If we don't, facility. it just has a chilling effect. I mean, it was it'd be like a sedative on the market, really. You wouldn't right. be able to boost. You wouldn't be able to ramp up. Like, I think it's we need to have some sort of overlap. Are we legally allowed to have an overlap, do you think? If we I think if we called it something else. Yeah. <laughs> 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 exactly the way I said it. I think if you uh, draft it in a way that makes clear that they can't really, like, be fully operating to licenses at the same time, but there's some ability to maintain multiple locations without being in violation right. of, a, of either their old or new license. I think that is within the spirit of the right. Right. statute. But yeah, you couldn't you couldn't use the transition to be operating two licenses in contravention of your. All right. So you'd have to apply first, then ramp up, right? Yeah, and I think you could have potentially, like, say you're moving from one location to another, have some grace period where the move, the process of moving doesn't put you in violation of your license. But you couldn't be like, oh, wow, I'm growing at it, cultivating at two locations. You know, that I think would be a violation. Yeah. And I think to some degree this will end up being an enforcement thing as well, and discretionary as much as it is, like, um, defining it precisely. Okay. But we'll... Yeah. The short answer is yes. I think you can do something like that without being in violation of the statute. Yeah, if you have an outdoor or an indoor growing, you're just jumping up a square footage tier. That transition should be relatively quick, I would imagine. It's just these unique situations where it might just take a little bit more oversight from our enforcement division to make sure it's done appropriately. Absent uh, kind of changing of tiers, people licensees can change their location with a kind of amendment to the board or something like that. Yeah. 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 That'll be an operational thing, I think. So now we're moving on to if we're ready. Yep. Moving on to license tiers, section 1.3. Um, a number of comments first about cultivation license tiers, 1.3.1. All I'm gonna I'm gonna read a few of these because they're all very interrelated. Save some for later, but I think it's a little less related. Um, so here's a few of them. Update, this should be updated to accommodate what I believe 
I, 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 I'm, I rephrase this comment uh, because I believe the board's already made some decisions about mixed cultivation tiers. So this section needs to be updated to be in agreement with what I think you've already decided in some of your conversations and recommendations to the legislature, but we should be clear on that today um, and then make any final, just finalized decisions on that stuff for the purposes of this section. Then there are several comments on both sides of the following debate, either make plant counts equivalent, uh, plant count equivalents for all outdoor tiers. That's one side of the debate and you got comments strongly encouraging you to do that. And then you got several comments strongly encouraging you to eliminate any reference to plant counts anywhere. So that's something for you to consider as you're thinking about these tiers. And then I'll drop in the mixed light provision again here. And then the final piece, and then there's a couple of there's other issues that I think are a little more discreet and you can tackle after you discuss this chunk of info, but I will just note there's a long comment here, which I know you've all read, that essentially has a number of proposals around what the uh, mixed tier licensing options could or should be, along with um, policy reasons for doing so. And uh, I'll just note those real quick here. This, this, these commenters recommend that um, there basically be sort of like a, a scale that accommodates the economics of the different types of growing. Essentially, it would be a, a one to two to four scale in terms of sizing. So indoor would be the one, the baseline. Mixed light would get to grow twice as much for a similar economic effect. Outdoor would get to grow four times as much for similar economic effect. Again, that's their argument about what the economics of it are. Uh, so their proposal would be something like uh, tier one would be um, 1,000 square foot indoor, 100 plants outdoor. Tier two, 2,000 indoor, 200 plants outdoor. Tier three, 3,000 uh, and 300. And then I'm going to skip down and um, and they have an alternative tiering plan. Again, just want to, this is what you're going to be discussing, but just want to make it clear that we are going through all the comments here. Um, so we have, let's see. This uh, and this, these commenters recommend that mixed light not actually be an outdoor uh, grow, which is what was mentioned earlier this meeting, but would instead be an artificial lighting, um, would be in the realm of indoor and uh, would be in the scope of artificial lighting. What they mean by that is because it would be defined as indoor. Um, and then they sort of recommend something where instead of having it be a mixed license type where you can grow some indoor, some outdoor and one license type that you can purchase one of each type of license. We can discuss that more if, if you'd like in terms of the limitations on that in the statute. Um, but again, they sort of have another tiered system around that follows their one to four ratio around the um, around what it what the amount should be. And they have recommendations regarding fees, which as the board knows, you don't have the power to set, but um, uh, so yeah, they have a 4,000, 2,100 for outdoors mixed light, indoors for the craft tier, and then a maximum tier that would be an acre for outdoors, 22,000 square feet for uh, mixed light and 10,000 for indoors. So anyway, just wanted to put all that out there too. That was one, that was an extended comment on the same subject. But to summarize, I think what makes sense to discuss now is, Revisit and finalize decisions about cultivation tiers you've already made, plant count equivalents or no plant count equivalents, and where does mixed light growing go? Those are the three things to talk about now. You say those three again, sorry. Um, revisit and finalize cultivation tier decisions you've already made, or that I believe you've already made <laughs> about um, mixed tier and so forth. And I think you have, yeah. Um, Plant count equivalents or no plant count equivalents, and mixed light. Where does it go? Do you or do you have it? Period. And if you do have it, where does it belong? All right. Um, mixed tier sizes. Uh, I can tell you where we ended up on that. Um, a tier one was. 1,000 square feet indoor um, plus 50 
plants outdoor uh, for $1,800. Tier two was 1,000 feet indoor, 125 outdoor um, for 2250 And then tier three was 2,500 indoor and 200 outdoor. Those seem fine to me. I don't feel like, I mean, we've debated this. We've heard comments on this. I see the recommendation from old growth organics, which seems to make sense. But again, you know, we're essentially combining uh, the indoor tiers, not creating new new tiers of indoor. Um, so those numbers don't fully square with what we've done on the indoor side of things. So, I mean, we can have the conversation about plant count versus canopy. But are those, do we want to amend those? The only like question I really have for us, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement with you, I, it is like the middle mixed tier where it's 1,000 plus 125. I think we did that in the spirit of trying to keep as many of these mixed tiers under the purview of small cultivator as we possibly could because, you know, they enjoy a number of exemptions. Um, and so my question is, do we want to allow the only thing I would suggest maybe having a conversation about is do we want to find an equal medium of indoor between 1,000 and 2,500 just to think about this graduate kind of approach. Honestly, I'm kind of okay with where we are, but that was the one spot where I thought we could have a conversation. Can you say that last part again, the graduate? So, so yeah, I mean, we have 1,000 plus 50, 1,000 plus 125, and 2,500 plus 2, and I mean, I know that the 1,000, the 2500 kind of fits in line with our current indoor modeling. Um, but was wondering, you know, that middle one, there's no room for growth indoor. So do we want to provide any, you know, intermediate step or put 2500 there and kind of kick it to a higher tier in, in the third one? The, the, the cost there is you're going to lose the small cultivator protections that you might otherwise have in that middle mixed, mixed tier, which from my perspective might outweigh just being able to grow some more, but then again, you know, I'm sure folks feel might feel differently. I mean, it almost seems like you eliminate the tier one, 50 outdoor, leave the tier two, tier three, and then maybe create a, a, a third tier with higher indoor or higher outdoor. I mean, is that kind of where you're getting it? I don't know, say it one more time. Yes, you both have said the same thing in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday. It's Monday. We're trying. So can we just kind of, because we wanted a mixed tier small cultivator, right. we essentially just came up with, you know, 1,050, right? 1,000 square feet indoor, 50 outdoor. And then as we kind of thought about it more, we thought we should have some more of these tiers. Um, and so maybe that first tier that we kind of just originally conceptualized isn't the best like maybe maybe we maybe we don't need that tier but we need a larger tier so yeah no and again it's 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 conceptually do we want these mixed tiers to follow up more within the line of the small cultivator mantra of how we're kind of conducting business or is there a point before the 2500 and 200 or maybe we adjust that completely that would allow for a higher you know ratio of mixed light or excuse me mixed use Mixed indoor, mixed outdoor growing, depending on what somebody wants to do from a business decision. I think if you, in kind of the same vein, if you make that what's considered tier two now, the first tier, you have a little bit more space to grow. Right. And then you could actually, I think what we're suggesting is. Have a 5,000 and 500. Something, something like, like that. that. So cut the first one and make a bigger one at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind you of You think what, it still accomplishes what you were looking to accomplish, just in a different way. I wasn't trying to accomplish anything. I think I was just drawing attention to uh, <laughs> if we, the way it's structured now, there's more small cultivator protections for the mixed growing. And I'm okay with pivoting off that. I just want folks to recognize that if that's what we're going to do. Yeah. I think we'll meet more folks where they want to be if we do put in like a 5,500 or some type of equivalent growing. I know that there are some folks that want to grow indoor and outdoor, and we might be limited from a statutory perspective with granting those license types, right? I think. I mean, you can just design them so they're single license. Right. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. 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 My only he hesitancy 
at changing this at all is we have a fee bill that's been um, introduced. It's gotten at least three or four hearings, and we keep on changing it every single time. And it's not the legislature that's changing; it's us and it's coming back to change. Yeah. Um, which is not helpful to them because it's kind of like, well, is this final or not? When can we act on this? Um, I agree. Which is, you know, it's it's a little bit of a problem. Like we want to get it right. So I'm not saying that we should let that hinder us too much, but uh, yeah, the only reason that I even brought that up, even because it seems like who's going to really get the tier one if for, you know, 400 extra dollars, you can, you know, almost, you know, you can get 125 plants and, you know, it just, it feels, I mean, and maybe there's someone, maybe there's a, a market out there for a smaller, um, but I mean, uh, I, yeah, I almost feel like we should just leave this alone and see if this is a license type that people are, are really interested in. So while I think what we discussed in terms of the tiers is probably better, I'm concerned about I'm a little bit more concerned about the fee bill right. and moving that through so that all of the fees are ready when we need them to be. Right. Yeah, so I, I think I'm with you in terms of leaving this the way it is now, knowing that the fees are reviewed every three years. Well, we can the fees by generally speaking are reviewed every three years that we can change fees in between. Right, well. but in a year or two or three, we right. would have a better assessment of the market and, and like you're saying, whether or not this is something people are really interested. Right. I think this does do a lot for the small cultivators that we're trying to encourage. You know, I think, you know, when you have a 5,000 indoor and 500 plants outdoor, I know everything's kind of scalable for Vermont, but that's starting to get to what we would consider a larger tier, yeah. um, larger cultivation. So, you know, we're starting to move away from trying to accommodate small cultivators right. towards medium and larger size companies for Vermont. So why don't we leave it? Why don't we leave it as is? But so we should we should talk about plant plant count versus square footage. Um, I think we you know the reason that I wanted um, the equivalency for the small cultivator is to accommodate people's unique growing styles and not trying to force people to really you know sacrifice some good growing practices, regenerative growing practices, in order to kind of maximize the amount of plants they can fit into a plot. Um, you know, allow kind of rows in between with other vegetation, um, allow kind of the chickens to run wild um, for pest control purposes. Um, so I thought that was a good justification. We got some calculations from some commenters about what the equivalent of a thousand square foot indoor should be as an outdoor plant count that I think we can rely on as the justification for the 125. Whether we apply that kind of same ratio to larger outdoor um, peers, we run into the problem that we're very quickly going to get beyond an acre. And if you say if you apply, if you assume that a thousand square feet is equal to 125 plants, and apply that ratio to 5,000, you know, you know that create a plant count that's equivalent. You know it. It's impossible to kind of like say that that can happen under an acre. Now, do we care? I mean, it certainly called brings in some other regulatory agencies that maybe don't want to participate in this. Um, but you know, we could. It's not our. It's not on us. You know, we could just disclose to people or advise people that this might. You know, if you grow above this size, you might have to talk to ANR. You might have to talk to, you know, NRB. Yeah. Yeah, I still don't know how I feel necessarily on this issue, and I know we're coming to a point where decisions <laughs> need to be made. I'm really anxious about Act 250 and how there could be a patchwork of interpretations among district coordinators in the state if it's if there's too much kind of discretion built into it all. Um, from a, you know, the plan count so high that you can spread out on a large area of land and then how that land potentially could be counted for current use versus tax at a different rate. And I've just I'm kind of cloudy in my head on how how hard that might be to, from a current use perspective, the use appraisal program at the tax department to identify 
a specific area of your land that might be taxed differently than you know otherwise, depending on if it's an agricultural product or not. The small cultivators are still relieved from all of that, though, right? Like they're sort of protected from the having to deal with that additional regulatory burden. It's the larger ones that would be a concern, right? Yeah, I don't know. In my mind, I, I feel like doing a plant count for like a equivalent plant count for each of the outdoor tiers makes sense. Yeah, I mean. Just makes me anxious. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I agree. The failure rate outside is going to be a lot more indoors. It's going to be more equitable. Excuse me. The yeah. failure rate is going to be a lot higher outdoors. It's more equitable to do plant counts, at least in the outdoor context, to try and line up with that ratio that we've heard from some commenters about. But the way that our state laws operate, put the practical effect a little bit further, you know, behind the, the more real conversation about Act 250 in my head. But I mean, um, if we want to go in that direction, you know. You do it. I'm not I'm not opposed. I'm not going to stand down that hill. Um, I just think we need to be realistic with what's in front of us. Yeah. So, like, a, if you apply the ratio, you know, twenty thousand square feet of outdoor would be the equivalent of twenty five hundred plants. So you're not going to grow that in under an acre. So we either have to decide that we just that was kind of we designed that for a reason, but we don't care anymore. And let the kind of cultivators figure it out with natural resources board, their local folks, the a agency of natural resources, um, which they might have to do anyway, honestly. Um, is it an or like it's this, you could could I guess my question is. Do you, if you were to grow a certain amount in a like contiguous square footage or a number of plants? We said or. or. It, okay. I don't know if the square footage is really relevant. Right. If we're growing 2,500 plants, like what's the purpose of the square footage then? Well, I guess what I'm thinking of is if I were a larger cultivator and I thought, okay, I don't want to trigger these other regulatory issues, I would just grow less in a smaller amount of space outdoors rather than trying to hit the maximum plant count that I can have. And that would be a choice of the licensee, you know, and they could decide whether or not they wanted to trigger those regulatory burdens or not. From a enforcement perspective, I wonder if one's easier than the other. Um, you know, the way I expected us doing plant counts is, you know, maybe taking the aerial photograph and just counting them, which gets a little bit more complicated when you're talking about 2,500 yeah. plants um, versus 125. You know, it's a little bit easier to kind of take an aerial photograph and figure out what the square footage of that area is. And I mean, the, my one other concern is, you know, there's a significantly more amount of plants that you would put plant under a license type under the the um the plant count versus the square footage and how does that also affect our supply demand model we're gonna have a lot more supply which is not a bad thing i'm just raising it as a a point that i don't know if we have the answers yet to how much it could potentially affect our i don't have a sense of how that affects that 80 20 split that we've been talking about me neither um certainly it'll mean that those kind of oversupply peaks will be more exaggerated mm -hmm. in the harvest time. Um, but how much are we really trying to kind of be in charge of that, you know, as opposed to, again, letting the free market kind of like help? You don't want that. Obviously, it means that a lot of product might go unused, might end up on the on the illicit market. Um, and that the price will fluctuate pretty, you know, wildly in those harvest times potentially um, but how much is it our job to really try to control that 
Do we know what the average sort of like crop loss is in like a first year of growth outdoors? If somebody were to grow the maximum amount of plants that we were talking about, the 2,500, like what is, what's the ratio of crop loss? I don't know if I have a set ratio in my head. I'd imagine if there's a hundred and well, first, well, this is a Pandora's box of questions. <laughs> um, I would imagine if there's like 125 plants, I bet you maybe 80 of them ish might end up making it the market in some way, shape, or form. You know, then we're also looking at plants that could be sales and right. everything else. So. Um, it's hard to pin down a specific number, but that that's my, I, I could be way off base. I'm sure somebody will let me know if I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking in terms of the supply and demand, if we knew you know, people are going to grow 2,500 plants, but 10% of them are likely to not make it, then that sort of evens out that supply and demand model a little bit in terms of the peaks that, that Pepper was talking about. Right. Oh, I don't necessarily know if I have a good answer on this yet do we want to do plan number for the first two tiers as in uh 125 plants for is the equivalent of a thousand and if you're a tier two cultivator outdoor you could do 2500 or like 315 plants which is the rough equivalent i'm just wondering like then we're gonna then we're going to like um, find more people trying to fit into that 2,500 square foot number and price range and fee. And we're going to lose folks that are looking to grow at a higher square footage and would pay us a higher fee. And I'm just still wondering how the whole, how much money we generate from fees and how much supply and demand is really impacted here. So you'd prefer to leave it as it is right now. I think where my head's at right now is let's leave the 125 all cultivators and then move forward and maybe i don't know after this meeting what kind of still opportunities do we have to ask those questions of our consultants and stuff like that without and then we can revisit this in another meeting um with some more kind of concrete information okay i would propose that because i want to make sure that we understand the, the ripple effects of doing so okay well it also nicely squares Finds the middle ground between the commenters who want us to eliminate it or <laughs> uh, keep the square footage. I, mean, uh, keep the I brought footage. the plant down to the conversation for small cultivators, recognizing that inequity at the thousand square foot level, and there's protections or there's exemptions for a thousand square foot indoor growers that are the same as thousand square foot outdoor growers. And because they get the same exemptions, yet indoor growers can generate four times the amount of flower, you know, that's why I wanted to tie it specifically to, to the small cultivators initially recognizing that it would open the door to this conversation. I just don't think we felt I have a clear understanding of the potential impacts move in that direction. I think it potentially could be easier to regulate from a plant count perspective. Um, in my conversations with Ag, they kind of thought it might be, but how it affects the overall market is is more of where I'm still a little uncertain and I'm not opposed to it. It's just making sure we have all the information that we need to make that decision. All right, well, um, I think we should, at our next meeting, make a final decision on this. But for now, the decision is to just leave it the way it is. So the one, the one tier could have square footage or plant count. Tier one outdoor cultivators. You see what I mean, though. If, even if we open it up to the second tier, then technically you could have the same or more amount of plants growing outdoors in tier two than you could in tier three, depending on how you, depending on spatial needs, or at least it would be close. It, it kind of de incentivizes folks to seek higher outdoor tiers and pay thus a higher fee to produce at that higher tier. Right. And so that's you know a concern that I have just understanding. That we need to be be supported to the most that we fundamentally can be, and also just figuring out supply demand issues. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we need to clarify whether canopy needs to be contiguous? Uh, let's hold off on that one. Let's. Um, we yeah. aren't quite there yet. I wanted to make sure we had a decision on the mixed light provision. Yeah. So other state, and we've heard a lot about mixed light. I think in lieu even of like changing 
and I, I want to provide some type of clarity for folks that that use a specific style of growing kind of because I think we're we're trying the best to meet people where they're at and, and you know we talked about mixed tiering and we decided to leave things as is there's some folks that are advocating for a new mixed light category tiering or license type I don't think in lieu of trying to make sure our fee bill moves that's the right decision to make I've been looking at like, California's rules they do have a mixed light tiering option one is at six kilowatts per square foot which is essentially a light bulb <laughs> um, that kind of helps plants from flowering at certain times of the year they have another higher license type that's six to 25 kilowatts per square foot I'm, I'm tempted to just allow outdoor grow I'm tempted to suggest to allow outdoor growers, these hoop house styles, these outdoor greenhouses, we already have some energy exemptions for folks, I think, utilizing under 40 kilowatts per hour of power in their greenhouse. But I think if we had clarity that outdoor growers are using six kilowatts per hour or less of, of lighting, that could, uh, you know, help folks meet in the middle and anything over six kilowatts per hour would still be thus considered indoor. So the if you're using mixed lighting under six kilowatts, it would be considered outdoor growing? And anything above that would be considered yeah. indoor. Yeah, I mean, um, trying to just split the difference and meet people where they're at. Is that where people are at? I have no idea. I think so. I mean, I'm sure folks would advocate for another mixed use licensing tier from the six to 25 like California does, but I don't think we can pivot right now. I think it's something that we can look to in the future, but for purposes of clarity right now, allowing that very small amount of artificial light to be used in an outdoor hoop house or greenhouse operation can signal that we understand that it's an issue and will help some people now. And, and if we continue to hear that it's not enough, we can explore in, in future years. So is that enough to help if it's like a really dark summer, a really rainy, cloudy summer? I, I don't necessarily think that it does, but that's part of the risk that you take as an outdoor grower. Right. I just, and that, but it does help if you have, you know, a particular plant that needs a little bit more help. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we have a very bright line right now between indoor and outdoor. This certainly starts to blur that bright line um, in a way that one might require some additional enforcement mechanisms. Um, meaning more staff, uh, and two, um, you know, I have some concern that, okay, just kind of like what you were saying, Julie, is, you know, if someone's seeing their plants needing more than six kilowatts per square foot, they're going to do it. You know, if their plants, if their crop is dying, um, or it's not, you know, growing the way it's supposed to, and then, and then what, we consider them indoor, you know, mm -hmm. and then, and then what? Like, what if they're growing, you know, well, it's a different license type. So, you know, the, the bright line is helpful for us and on multiple fronts. Um, I just don't know how you really quantify. I mean, unless we're auditing their electricity bills, which I guess, you know, we can do. Um, how to make sure that this six watt per um, square foot, kilowatt per square well, other states have specific tiers that allow for this, which leads me to think that they have had a reasonable amount of success regulating it. Yeah. I think part of it's on us. I think in my talks with, with folks, whether it's Jacob or Carrie or something like that, I think this is a necessary thing that we need to try and figure out a path for. I think it blurs a little bit of the line and, and creates a little bit more enforcement discretion in a sense but I, I in lieu of trying to create a new licensing tier right now i think i still think this is a very small accommodation that'll be very obvious to any enforcement agent that's out there to kind of see what kind of lighting they're using to kind of draw that distinction this is essentially the kind of light you would have in a tent i don't even know if it's that strong it's like the light you might find in your bathroom is, is jacob Talk to you about this. Yeah. And how does he feel? I think it's essentially an oversight on our part not to address at this point at this point in the process. So he thinks it's necessary. 
for some types of growing styles, yes. I mean, we can revisit it in a, in a future meeting if you would like, and we can kind of build a record similar to the account conversation, but I, I think six kilowatts per square foot is, a, it's not a very high amount of, of energy usage at all. So, and we received this comment, I think it was from the Vermont Equity Coalition. Well, they're asking for a new tiering. <clears throat> they're asking for a whole new mixed mixed light tier. And I, again, I don't think we're at a point in the process to allow for that. I think we've heard from some others who use certain techniques to prevent plants from flowering at certain points throughout their plant life. And are you able to comment on this maybe yep. from a staffing perspective? Yep. Yep. So as the board knows, I put forth our staffing request and our <clears throat> budget request to the legislature based on the recommended license tiers that you created in the October 15th report. So as I've as I've said to the three of you many times, I really think that that budget request reflects the absolute minimum of what we need to achieve the objectives of the legislature and kind of the first draft of our rules. This to me seems like a different tiering. This seems like a different tiering structure. And I think I would want to revisit our budget request based on that different tier type, um, which doesn't mean you can't do it that way. I would just um, I, I would want to revisit that um, what we've put forward for our budget. So I think it complicates the inspection process. Um, I think it requires additional energy usage reporting review. Um, and I, I think it's going to result in needing some additional staff. So then why don't we um, put this off till our next meeting and really try and decide uh, what the staffing looks like, what the compliance looks like. Okay. Um, and we can make a final decision on this and whether we need to apply flame counts to other outdoor like, tiers on, on Thursday. I think it might be useful also to consider that we know that we'll have to come back and look at our rules again after the market launches. I mean, yeah. there is no regulatory body that's launched their market that hasn't had to go back. So right. Maybe this is maybe we need a parking lot of things that we have to address in a year when we have a little bit more data to look at. Well, one thing to add to that is we will know how many staff we have in a year <laughs> <laughs> and what they can do, <laughs> and we will know what the workflow looks like. So I think um, I, I agree with that point. I think there are several areas um, where you may just want to, it may make sense to wait for a year and revisit the goals then, because undoubtedly we will be doing that anyway. It will go by quickly, as this past year has. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, David, those are the three areas you told us to discuss. Yeah, we punted on all. <laughs> we punted on most. <laughs> um, all right, on to the next step. Um, next substantive thing is clarify whether canopy outdoors needs to be contiguous. <clears throat> I don't, I don't think it does. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would suggest that perhaps we have some limitation as in the same span number, same property number, same address. Um, yeah, address can get somewhat complicated, um, but uh, I think, and then, you know, people are gonna draw a map for us. And if it's just too impossible to regulate, I think we can send it back and say, try again. Um, you know, if it's ones in the, Bristol and ones in Starksboro, or right? half your plot is there, half your plot is there. Um, but I, I think uh, I don't think it needs to be contiguous. Yeah, I think it, it it recognizes that we're not a midwestern state that's flat for miles upon end, so it'll benefit folks that have unique land that they're trying to take advantage of to allow yeah. mini plots to happen within that a lot of square footage. But perhaps on the same property, the same span number. Same span number. Yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. I want, I, considering our staff, we don't necessarily want them hiking all over. Right. Looking for plants. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Brent, is that okay for from a staffing perspective? Yep. And then 
Yep. All right, we're yep. good on that. Thank you. And then the next one is really a drafting plan. Unless somebody wants to say something, you don't have to. This is just noting that the mixed tier terminology was a little inconsistent as currently drafted. So I just need to go through and make sure we consistent. Moving on from there, um, we are going to the next section, 1.3.2, which is the um, uh, retail tiers. Is that right? Yes, the yep. retail tiers. And this was a comment talking about basically that the nursery retail tier is a little thin in its definition. And uh, some decisions need to be made about it in terms of what you want to do with that, flush it out, fold it in, fold the sort of effective operations in somewhere else, whatever that's going to look like. But there needs to be some discussion about what are we really trying to do with that one. So I've been obviously thinking a lot about this, and there have been a lot of questions in the Ways and Means Committee about this license type, which really just aren't unanswerable at this point because we haven't decided yet. Um, one, so the the reason that I think this license type is very important, uh, mostly because I think some cultivators will, will really want to just focus on genetics and R and D, um, and really have their kind of cultivation be more around kind of creating um, new strains, new cannabinoid profiles, et cetera, and then selling those to other cultivators. Um, and you know, I'm not as concerned about home cultivation at you know, at this point, um, but it's really about how does a new cultivator um, start up a business? Where do they get their seeds and where do they get their clones? Uh, so to me, having a retail nursery license made a lot of sense, but it does open a kind of Pandora's box about what this looks like. Do buffer zones apply? Is it unlimited canopy? You know, uh, what happens to mature plants that, uh, you know, become mature? you know, at the nursery because they're mm -hmm. unsold. Um, you know, is there a kind of outdoor allowance, indoor allowance? Um, there's a lot that needs to be decided on this. And, you know, frankly, if these folks are selling, then, you know, I think there's a, there are some kind of, are people under 21, um, you know, are they, we doing ID checks? are all the same retail regulations applying um, to these folks that are really kind of mostly selling intra supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is the home home cultivation, but um, so to me, I really think that what we should do here is move in a slightly different direction. Um, there's language in S-188, um, it's in the Agriculture Committee, that changes the definition of cultivator. Um, ever so slightly, but it has a big impact, which would allow cultivators to sell seeds and clones to other licensees. Um, it also allows wholesalers to sell seeds and clones to other licensees. I think, you know, one thing that we could do is take that language from S-188, hopefully S-188 passes, but if it doesn't, then we're in trouble here. Eliminate the nursery license, but add that language um, around the definition of cultivator to the fee bill, potentially, if, if it's allowed. I mean, we can't just decide that, but make sure it's moving in at least a couple different places um, to help its chance of getting over the finish line and allow cultivators to sell their genetics to other cultivators uh, or other re uh, retail storefronts and just other licensees. And that, to me, really allows us to not have to I mean, to me, if we keep a nursery license, we honestly probably should create nursery license tiers, um, you know, about how much canopy they can have indoor, outdoor. And it just opens up a can of worms. That I don't think we really necessarily want to go down. Um, from a compliance perspective, it makes things a heck of a lot easier um, to just say cultivators can sell their plants to other cultivators or other licensees. And, um, and it, uh, does provide kind of, you know, cultivators have asked us to do direct to consumer sales. That's not what this is, but it offers a kind of, a, it starts to ease into the idea that cultivators should be allowed to sell their the products that they've spent a lot of time, you know, building the genetics of. So to me, I, I really think that the, the thing to do here is eliminate this license type and add 
language that would allow cultivators to sell to other license types. Only to other license types, not to consumers. See, you know, I really we open if we allow members of the public to come in and purchase, it opens That's up a whole. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I do think that the retail storefront allows sale of plants and clones or seeds and clones to members of the public. So this would allow cultivators to sell their genetics to a retail storefront that could then be, you know, sent to the, you know, home cultivators that, that kind of. But I, I don't think we necessarily like it's a much bigger regulatory lift on our side if we allow home cultivators to buy from you know, a nursery side. So that was the kind of thought that came to mind. I did run it through, um, you know, our partners on the advisory committee of community of agriculture. And you know, in some ways it was kind of like, well, I guess that's a, a good way to deal with it. Um, you know, it wasn't like an enthusiastic two thumbs up, but uh, you know, it does solve a lot of the problems that this license site was intended to solve without having to create this infrastructure to support yeah. this license site. I agree with that. I would agree it's not a perfect alternative but it's where we're at and in spirit like we've already talked about of having a fee bill that moves relatively quickly plus questions associated i think it's probably prudent for us to try and move in that direction yeah for better or worse so did you catch that I, I did yeah, yeah. um Great. So moving on to section 1.3.3 manufacturing license, manufacturing license tiers. Uh, this is actually commenting on not something that isn't yet in the rule, but which the board has, I believe, made the final made a decision to put in the rule. And one of our, um, I believe one of the commenters listening to you had a verbal comment about just making sure that they under that we can understand what tier three manufacturing will be. I know the proposal had uh, sort of uh, sales gross sales limit um and otherwise similar to tier two but just wanted clarification on that so i think in and i'll just speak because i proposed it my, in my mind it was very clearly a home occupation and a sole proprietorship or a partnership or a family business but not a, a business that has a, multiple employees i'm wondering if this comment came in before we kind of talked more extensively about this at like last week's meeting or Whenever we did actually talk about it, I can't remember. And, and, and I put every substantive comment is in here, even if you guys are already clear. It's not it. Is that general outline look sound good to everybody here? What's the general outline? Like home occupation and that under what, 10,000? Mm -hmm. Able that? to do everything that a tier two license yeah. can do and um not a business that has like a number of employees so maybe one employee sole proprietorship or partnership family business but not playing people okay how much of the kind of home food processor home baker regulations can we lift from the department that seems to me like kind of where I was thinking that we go on this, which is anything that applies to a home food manufacturer selling less than 10,000 would apply here to these folks, including the inspection requirements, which are actually none. You know, there is no guarantee of, an, I mean, we're allowed to inspect, but there's no, we're not going to commit to any sort of inspection and inspecting reg regimen. Does that seem like the direction? you were thinking yes yeah okay. yeah and there was a comment in committee discussion the other day that ten thousand might be actually low um but i think we just leave it there for now and you know i, I just like the graduation and cultivators these folks can graduate um, yes yeah it's um, intended to be a startup or a side gig yeah okay. so ten thousand gross ten thousand yes yeah and that's in sales not just like the value yes. of the product that you can yes. yeah Okay. Okay. But all the same testing and labeling and packaging would apply. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
All right, so moving on to section 1.4.1, this is um, operating plans, the sort of basics of a application. One is just to add that email should be a requirement. This is basic. And then asking for a business address if available. The reason for the if available there is that this could, this also is the, what we're currently calling provisional license rules and it is certainly possible i think part of the intention of the provisional license was to allow somebody to apply before they necessarily actually have a location but have other stuff getting into place so we would we do we will require business address we already do require business address elsewhere in the rule but for here it would say we need an email contact for sure and business address if available just to clarify what we need there was nowhere where we previously asked for email which doesn't make much sense in the modern <laughs> yeah. Any, any issues? All right, great. Good. <laughs> and then <laughs> from the tax department on this, our colleagues at the tax department noted the following, had the following comment. Uh, there's a requirement for applicants to provide the CCD with a federal ID, federal tax ID number, but no social security number is needed for the individual principals and those who control an applicant. The tax department would suggest that you collect these social security numbers. Otherwise, the system of individuals who operate on behalf of the licensee who is a non-person entity is very similar to our system. We call them persons required to collect tax. That's a, that's a quoted term they used, quote unquote, persons required to collect tax, which are those individuals who control the corporate taxpayers. And they have a statutory site to that. So I believe what they were, <laughs> this comment isn't 100% clear, but I think what they're basically saying is, it makes sense for you to imitate what we do in tax, which is collect the social security numbers in addition to the federal tax ID number for those people who own and control the uh, the entity. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> so the next comment is pertains, I'd say, both to 1.4.1 and 1.4.3. 1.4.3 is the financier provision. Um, the comment is that in order to ensure that applicants cannot use clever corporate structuring to skirt the one license rule uh, established by Vermont statute, it is critical that the board require applicants to disclose all persons having both direct and indirect control of an establishment. The current uh, rule requires disclosure of all principles and persons having control of an establishment, but may not reach deep enough down to capture all indirectly controlling persons. And to put that another way, sometimes entities use complex corporate structures like nesting doll type structures. So an LLC owns an LLC, owns an LLC, so that you may ask for the controlling person, but person is a defined term that includes entity. And so all you're going to get when you do that is another LLC. You don't know who controls that LLC. And so somebody could hide behind those LLCs and effectively subvert the one license rule mm -hmm. using corporate structuring. And so the recommendation to ensure that doesn't happen here is uh, twofold. One, this is from the comments still, require disclosure of all principles of any control persons in addition to the listing of principles of the establishment. Then specify that the list of control persons must include both indirect, both direct and indirect control, regardless of the number of intermediating entities which may be involved, such that for each directly or indirectly controlling entity, the identity of at least one natural person is ultimately disclosed. So basically, it's saying you have to tell us the human beings who are behind this thing. And the point of that is, again, to make sure that the one license rule is not subverted by clever structuring. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. I And I would just say from the lawyer standpoint, I did. I think that the way it's currently written, it would allow for somebody to hide behind corporate entities. If we didn't give ourselves enough authority to look behind that. I think that was the intention. The intention wasn't met, so I think that this makes sense. Okay. okay. One point four point two subsection G. This commenter says 
This provision requires an applicant to describe criminal actions against an applicant principal or person. Quote on, that's a quotation. Uh, this appears to be unintentionally overbroad as the reference to person is not qualified by any proximity to the applicant. The recommendation, this is still in the comment, revised so that the disclosure is required with respect to any person directly or indirectly controlling the license. I'll just say that I think this is essentially a technical error. Um, I think the commenter is right that that person is sort of floating out there without any attachment, but I think this is really like a grammatical drafting error, not substantive, and I think that we should fix it as the commenter says, but happy to take any. Uh... All right, so then looking at 1.4.2, H has the exact same error as G, so fix it there too. Um, then moving on to the substantive issue. This is about um, disclosure of civil actions, which is required in uh, in G. Is that right? Do I have that right? No, H, sorry. H is about disclosure of civil actions, which is required right now under the rule draft. This requires, reading the comment here, requires the disclosure and the description of any civil action to which the applicant, principal, or person was a party. This requirement may exceed your rulemaking authority uh, as the Vermont statutes does not direct the board to review civil records as opposed to criminal administrative records and is not tailored to achieve the statutory goal of ensuring that applicants do not pose a threat to the proper function of the regulated market. And the recommendation from the commenter is to either eliminate this requirement entirely, which is the commenter's preference, or narrow it substantially so that it only requires disclosure of recent civil actions, with no, for example, within no more than the past five years, in which the applicant's principles or controlling persons was accused of conduct that would reasonably demonstrate that the relevant person presently poses, sorry, presently poses a threat to the proper function of the regulated market. And um, just make one lawyer point at the beginning. I, I I don't agree that this exceeds your rulemaking authority. I do think that Section 881 of uh, Chapter 33 gives you very broad authority over the applications, but that does not address the policy question about what you need to know, and I leave that to you to decide what you really think you need to know here. Um, so, I think that there are some civil actions that uh, could um, implicate the proper functioning um, of a regulated market. And so I'm fine with narrowing this. Uh, I don't really think that we need to narrow it in the way that's being recommended here, uh, just because I think there's a lot of discretion um, and a lot of kind of gray area about you know, what the person might think poses a threat versus what we might think poses a threat to the proper function of the market. So I would say we just narrow it to, you know, the past 10 years. And, you know, civil actions can take years to resolve. So I don't think five years is necessarily sufficient. Um, so I would say that we just look at civil actions within the last 10 years. And with that? Sure. All right, moving to 1.4.3, this is the section about financiers. Commenter recommends that there should be an exception to this disclosure requirement for traditional lenders like banks. This could be done by building in a reference to the definition of financial institution, which we have elsewhere in statute already. Um, that's the first, that's the substantive comment. Um, I, I mean, I think it makes sense. I don't, I don't think you're really looking to understand who owns the banks and things like that. You're really looking at non-conventional financing and making sure that somebody isn't getting behind the one license rule, but I, I leave that up, up to you. Yeah. Okay. If someone's, we're talking about kind of chartered accredited banks, you know, so the financial institution definition here would come it should cover that. It will cover that. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, Subsection B of one point, subsection B1 of 1.4.3, uh, I believe is comment or kind of drafting error essentially. Apparently says that um, the following may be required, following disclosures may be required at the board's discretion requirements to disclose information to a licensed establishment, the board or department of finance regulation. I don't think, I think licensed establishment is not what we meant to say there. 
because I don't really know what that means. And I think the commenter didn't know what it meant. They were right. Um, I think we were saying we, the intention there was really just to say require disclosure to the board or the Department of Financial Regulation. I'm not sure why it was established and snuck in there. If any of you board members have another idea about that, I can change it. Otherwise, I think we just delete that reference. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Okay, so now moving on to 1.4.4, subsection A of 1.4.4. This is about the submission of various plans required by the rule, and it says that uh, uh, the commenter says it's unclear what benefit the board could derive from seeing a plan to register for a system that the board may or may not have notified applicants they must register for at the time the application is submitted or what such a plan would look like other than a conclusory statement that the application must comply. And the commenter recommends that the requirement be eliminated. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this for tier one cultivators. I'm fine with just an attestation, like saying that you will comply with the inventory tracking system. Um, something along those lines, or maybe we just eliminate it, just knowing that there's a requirement that they do it. So they don't really need to attest or deal with it. If they're not doing it, if they're in violation of that rights, maybe we just get rid of it. I think we'd want to know that they had signed up for it before they're issued their final license, right? right? But that's, I mean, if it's required in the rule, then we can just do that, right? Or do we have to write it separately? I don't think you need to write it. I mean, if they're not on it, then they are immediately in violation. Right. You can right. suspend if you need to. I and mean, I think you have other ways of getting it. I think we just want to- We have a- application checklist right that doesn't allow you to kind of like finish start operating until you completed the checklist this could just be one of those things on there essentially so yeah why don't we get rid of this okay all right moving on to 1.4.5 insurance taxation and banking requirements we have a, a number of, of comments on here so let's move through we have from our colleagues at the department again we have a comment saying there's a requirement to provide the span number if the applicant owns the site of operations. Um, and then the tax department asks, is the applicant required to own the site? What if they lease? Leasing land for agricultural use is permitted for current use, which is the tax designation that they're referring to. And the tax department says, so if they're leasing the space for the license, we would suggest you still collect the span number for those parcels. Um, I believe that is in reference to um, I think that we put in there that if your own if the owner needs to do it, but not yes, we put in the owner needs to do it. This is in subsection E. Sorry, I forgot to note the subsection here. Um, and they're just saying if they lease it, they should put in that designation as well. And this, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so then moving on to a comment about subsection A of the same section. Uh, the commenter says, recognizing these are commonly required or recommended for many or for most types of businesses. Uh, what is the accessibility and affordability of this type of insurance coverage for different types of cannabis establishments given the federal prohibition on cannabis? There isn't really, yeah, this is a comment. It's not really a recommendation, but uh, I did think it fell within the comment uh, purview here. So putting it in there, I don't know if you, the board had um, ideas on that. Let me just see. I think there is a comment that's related that may, is worth stating here as well in order to get similar subjects all out. Um, this comment, I'll try to summarize it. It's a long one, but essentially the commenter is saying that um, in order to secure these types, some of these types of things like insurance, um, at times you need to first have a state issued license. And they don't just limit it to this isn't just about subsection A. They're talking about things like a bank account or um, an escrow account or liability insurance. 
So they're saying that in order to get the license, it could become impossible because you're asking for information that requires them to have the license in the first place. Uh, they do note that constructing a two-part system might help where you can get an, a preliminary license. Um, and then that would help because then you could go back and get the rest of these things. Uh, I would note that there is, you know, provisional license piece that you've built in already sort of is that system, I think. Um, but I guess those two comments together are more just talking about the uh, the reality of acquiring these things in this market. And I, would, I don't know if there's a specific recommendation other than the pre preliminary license idea, which you already have, but um, I guess I'll just open it if there are comments on, on those, that issue, the sort of burden and challenge. Yeah, we can't be the first state to have dealt with this. Um, I wonder if, you know, BS has looked at this, and this isn't a comment from them, is it? No. Um, you know, I'm fine with offering some flexibility here, like within 60 days or something along those lines, 60, day, or 60 days of issuance of a license, but, um, I just don't know how real this concern is, or is it just all kind of theoretical? Well, I mean, if you are, if you apply for the provisional license first, um, you know, none of that information is required for that. So you could then go get your insurance and, but I suppose if you wanted to just apply for a license and skip the provisional process, yeah. that's where you would need a, yeah. a number of dates. I think, uh, I'm wary of allowing a business to operate without insurance, um, even if it's for 60 days. So I think, you know, if there's going to be some kind of leeway here, I think that there must, there should be part, you know, some sort of escrow, which I don't think requires, you know, I don't think, we never, I never asked the, the like financial folks whether they have a problem creating escrow accounts for cannabis businesses. And imagine that they do. Usually, it's really just a holding place for. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do we want to, you know, in other places in the rules, we have said you have kind of 60 days to come into compliance or submit additional information. Is this one where we want to give some window where people can, you know, submit their. I don't know when this comment came in, but it seems like we've already addressed this with the provisional license process. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess my only thought is what happens in three years when somebody's trying to get a license and they're, are we still gonna issue provisional licenses past the first year? I think we're gonna get to that. I think it's okay. on the list of things to discuss. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Never mind. <laughs> I mean, one thing you could, I'm, I'm very hesitant to recommend putting anything off, but um, we could check with fellow states and see what's happening as a practical matter elsewhere, just to confirm whether or not this is a real issue and how they're handling it. Right. Yeah, why don't we do that? And I, I'll reach out to, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll reach out to VSCCU and just ask them, you know, are they going to require an operating license before they're willing to kind of even consider opening a bank account for someone yeah. you know it's essentially a business is coming to them saying i want a bank account you know whether they get a license or not is kind of irrelevant to that question in a lot of ways i mean they, they have their own hesitations about giving bank accounts to cannabis businesses but um it's kind of not really tied to whether or not they actually have the license I would imagine You know, for a the, bank, it might be, right? Because they have to follow all those FinCEN guidelines. And so we've written our rules kind of around those guidelines. So when we issue a license, we're saying whoever we issue a license to meets all these guidelines, which we sort of built around those cool memo FinCEN guidelines. So yeah, they might want a provisional piece of paper that says, yep, at least this person's in this process. Right. I'll reach out to at least VSCCU. Yeah. They're named in this comment and just ask them. Um, what they think, um, and and in the meantime, we can ask BS strategies what's going on in other states. Otherwise, I think for now we'll just leave it the way it's written. 
That's good. So moving on to one, are, are we ready to go on? All right, 1.4.6 location information. The first bullet point here I think is really pretty technical, just noting that the rules should be clear that the business address that's provided is going to be like the official point of contact for the board. And by that, I mean, uh, if there's any violation issues or something like that, mail to that address will be expected to be. You know, if we, if we mail something there, we expect you got it basically. And I'll, you know, we'll draft that in a way that makes that clear. But just being clear that, you know, Put that on there, you're expected to check it and receive me all there. It's not just a sort of placeholder. Um, I could imagine there is some far out there places that might be a physical location where something's growing and they might not per se receive mail there. I mean, in, in that case, it doesn't have to be the same, though. it could be a PO box. That's what I was going to suggest that if you don't, if you don't receive mail to this address, you need to have some form of PO box or something else. Yeah, we can clarify that they don't have to be the same. Um, so the next comment is that there should should there be a requirement that diagrams of premises are provided. Currently, this is only required of cultivators in a different section. So probably. Yeah. <laughs> An oversight on our yeah. I don't think we need it for testing. No, but I think we like would need it for manufacturers probably, particularly tier one, right? Yeah. We require a security plan from retailers. I think that's kind of where yeah. I thought this would, you know, it's just present in other ways and other words and other sections. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we want to provide clarity that on that here too. You know, honestly, we looked at each one of these more intensely than we are. I mean, we're doing a pretty intensive dive, but when we originally proposed them, you know, we've really looked at other states and what they require. I think it's fine, you know. I think the security plan is essentially a diagram. I don't think this is necessary for testing. I don't think it's really necessary for product manufacturers. No. Uh, no. Well, I don't, you know, don't they have to separate certain like do we need a diagram if they have to separate the out the more dangerous? Solvent instructors in a different room than the well, less dangerous. We're just like, like going to have fire safety be in charge of that okay. aspect of it. Yeah. Um, okay. like I think this is kind of like a paperwork exercise, but I do think it's good to do it for cultivators because we have to go there and make sure you know what they're telling us matches. Okay. I don't think it's necessarily true of the other places beyond what we have, beyond what we've asked in there. I mean, it's it's okay to do it, but it's kind of like I don't know how much value it adds for us. I, the only other thought I have is: is it useful for inspectors to know to have some idea of what the layout of a space is when they're going to inspect? Similar to how firefighters, I mean, they don't have the layout of every um, like apartment building, but they generally get you know some information about that. So is there a safety reason for that? I don't know the answer to that. It's the only other question I have about it. Fire safety would still have those, yeah. especially for the more dangerous ones, you know. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with just remembering the work we did on each of these various license types. I'm, you know, I think, I think I'm comfortable with what we did. And there was special attention paid to cultivation here, just so we know where these plants are being grown, it's easier to figure that out from a manufacturing or a testing or a retail perspective because they're happening within a specific building. You know what I mean? There could be outdoor growing operations that are in multiple little plots that add up to a certain yeah. square footage and, you know, kind of off the grid, proverbially speaking. So. I'm just kidding. No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Next comment, depending on the type of establishment, particular business owners may or may not want their location information made available to the public. How does the CCB and state plan on making information about different types of establishments, um, which the establishments provide available to the public? I would just note here that there is a confidentiality provision in the statutes built in, and I, I think that the board is interpreting and will interpret that, especially locations of things like cultivation, um, 
uh, establishments will be considered to fall within that the confidentiality statute and the board would not make that type of thing public. But obviously, if you have stuff to add or different ideas. I would assume also that the state has security requirements for whatever technology we bring on board. Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, ADS would probably take care of that for us. Yeah, and I mean, in addition, I think we're trying to be pragmatic or progressive, for lack of a better way to describe it, in terms of our outdoor security measures, how other states have done it. I think recognizing that we need to keep some stuff co confidential will, will help back end some of the way that we hope to approach outdoor cultivation security from unknowing specifically where a grow site is. Um, yeah, Dave. I was just going to add, I mean, I think some other license types will likely be confidential, okay, like manufacturing right. wholesalers. There's no reason for the general public to know that. And there's good reason to not have that be you know, like for obvious public safety reasons. Retailers are very different uh, situation, but that's really the one exception there. So, David, it's one o'clock, and I think, you know, we're in between rules or yeah. sections right yeah. now. So maybe we want to pause. Does everyone want a quick a lunch break? Yeah, sure. 45 minutes? Yes. Yeah. Is that good for everyone? Sounds mm -hmm. good. All right, well, why don't we come back at 145 then? And uh, again, this is the Vermont Cannabis Control Board meeting on January 24th, 2022. Um, why don't we pick up where we left off, David? All right. So we left off at section 1.4.8 of rule one and the rec versus to the comment is from our colleagues again at the tax department saying we suggest an addition for something like quote to the department of taxes for purposes of administering the sales tax and cannabis excise tax. Um, I, you know, from the lawyer perspective, I think that's fine. I also don't think it's necessary, but it doesn't hurt. So. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a wash. Do we need that second part for purposes of administering no. the sales? I mean, tax. I don't think we need any of it, but I think that they saw that two other agencies were specifically mentioned. So, yeah. Yeah. Maybe one day left out. I guess. <laughs> yeah, why don't we just say uh, to the Department of Taxes and not clarify for what? I think That's it's pretty right. obvious um, what they're going to be doing with it. Uh, moving on to 1.4.9. There's a bunch of stuff on 1.4.9. This is the plans related to positive impact criteria. So we'll go through them piece by piece here. One comment is make clear that the update progress slash progress plan. Sorry, this is a. Uh, should have edited this before, but uh, make clear that update slash progress on 1.4.9 plans are required as part of a renewal. So in another part of the rule, it says that when you renew, you have to show your progress on these plans if they apply to you. And this commenter is saying, let's make it clear in this provision that that's something that's required, which is certainly fine to do. But um yeah i think it's fine if it helps people understand that that's the case okay so uh, i think that in. Um, so a couple comments on uh, moving on to 1.4.9 subsection D. A commenter says, I'm going to read two comments here because they're both about the lab exception. One commenter said, is this intended to apply to labs that exist currently? Question mark, should new labs be carved out as well? And then the Another comment says, why are testing laboratories exempt from meeting the positive impact criteria? Without further explanation, this commenter and their coalition feel strongly that testing laboratories should be required to meet the same positive impact criteria standards as other 
cannabis establishments. My recollection is that there had been concern just about ensuring that we have enough testing laboratories, but obviously that's a, this is a policy question for you all. In the way that I feel about this is, a we are we are we know that this is a um, a block in the supply chain or potential you know hiccup in the supply chain that we're not going to have enough testing capacity at least initially to meet the demands that kind of fifty five thousand pounds of cannabis et cetera. So I mean one that was part of the motivation too is these labs are not purely at least the existing ones, and I assume that the future ones are not strictly cannabis labs. They are licensed through us to do cannabis, but they can also do food prop testing, allergen types testing, of testing yeah. allergen testing. So uh, to me, you know, requiring them to change their entire business structure um, because they also test cannabis seem, seems a little odd. And then finally, um, Uh, I lost some train of thought there. Um, well, I'll just leave it there. And if the third point comes back to me, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, I understand about labs that exist, right, that are already in business. But what about, I mean, could we apply this to new labs that enter just to serve cannabis businesses or primarily to serve cannabis businesses? I do remember my third point. Okay, that is <laughs> Sorry. Right. You're welcome. Uh, is that all of these things are require additional costs and those costs are going to get passed on to the cultivators. They're not going to get passed on to the consumers. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, if there's additional compliance costs, then, they, then there's going to be, a, it necessitates increasing the fees that they charge to cultivators. Um, and that's not, you know, to me, that's not the area where we want those fees to be passed on. I mean, I'm, I'm fine if the price of cannabis, because it's tested, costs a little bit more to the consumer, but I, I don't want the cost of testing to go up to the cultivator. So those are the three points that I thought. <laughs> but um, really. At the same time, though, typically companies that invest in diversity and embrace it perform better financially. So, you know, there may be, and an, I don't know what the cost is. I mean, they're really, I wouldn't say that there's that much of a cost to an inclusive hiring plan, right? Or an inclusive contracting plan. Maybe the, um, you know, the community reinvestment, there's a cost too, but I don't, I don't know that the cost is that unachievable. You know, most companies are finding that they have to provide a livable wage to meet market demand anyway. So I just I think if there's an opportunity here, um, particularly because this is STEM, right? This is this is a science and technology field. There's a a way to make this more open to people of color. Then there's an opportunity to do that. Um, so I think there's a difference between there being a benefit to a company that does these things anyway, and then us requiring it. Um, I just, I can't get over the fact that we're going to need testing capacity and we're essentially going to need it immediately on day one. And so, you know, I say we will continue to waive labs from this section, um, and then revisit it in a year, um, when we know exactly how many labs we have and how short we of testing we actually are going to be. Um, I don't think there's any reason why, you know, we couldn't say you know, revisit this in a year and say, all right, new labs that are coming online, let's let's see um, what we would require. But that's just how I feel. I guess my concern is is having a different set of requirements for a, a new lab that only does cannabis versus our existing ones just creates, you know, a two track system that might be harder for us internally to, you know, keep straight, but maybe Maybe not. I don't know. I definitely appreciate that existing labs that have staff already in place that are you know, good at what they do, um, that are doing stuff not within the cannabis world, might feel less inclined to have to redo, you know, the ways that they operate in order to 
enter this market when they haven't had to do it for AMP. And if we're thinking that it's a glide path for them to, to come into our program from that perspective, you know, I don't know what kind of pause they might consider in coming in. I don't know. Feels a little like a missed opportunity, but perhaps it's just delayed. Yeah. I just, uh, you know, various points of supply chain, they don't need to all come online at once, but the second we start having harvests, we need the labs. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what, you know, that the product can't move any further until it's tested. So, me, I, I just, I feel like we need to do everything we can to get, you know, I was thinking about even having less restrictions for labs, even around some of their employee training, because um, they're going to have to do it anyway, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not like we need to require it. Um, you know, anything we can do to encourage more labs in year one is pretty essential to a proper functioning of the market. So I, I just, I'm pretty convinced that we just need to do whatever we can to encourage more labs. Um, and if that's kind of waving these and thinking about them again next year, to me, that, that makes sense. I agree. So lab waiver applies across the board or until reconsidered. Um, the next one is in subsection B2. Um, and, um, noting that it is ambiguous as to whether or not the three criteria, you need to have three criteria from each section or three criteria in total. Um, so I, my, my memory on this is not perfectly clear, to be honest with you. I think the original intention had been that it'd be three from each, but I could be misremembering that. I think that was the case. I think that's the way it reads to me. If, if that is the case, then you probably want to change the language. To I agree. One. Right. Is you there? You have one criteria from subsection C and at least one from subsection B, D. And then that's why I think there is some confusion here. There's three criteria from C and D. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, I, I agree that that was the intention and that if that was the intention, this is ambiguous. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wait one second. Moving on to subsection C, a commenter stated that they would like, uh, a commenter stated they want the freedom to hire people regardless of their chromosomes. That's how the commenter put it. Um, and I uh, assess that this is related to their, this appears to be a criticism of the inclusive hiring plan. Um, can respond as you want or not. I mean, I think the, the policy decision is already in there and it's already been made. So unless you're going to change it, then. So just to be clear, an inclusive hiring plan doesn't dictate who you hire. It's about a process, process equity, right? It's not about, you know, ensuring. It doesn't ensure a diverse purpose. Everyone is given an opportunity equally or an equitable opportunity. So. I don't think we need to change that. I don't either. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Uh, 1.4.9 C2. Um, so the commenter says paid leave is already required for many Vermont businesses pursuant to Vermont statute. So should that stay in regardless? Yeah, I was almost thinking on this to change plan for providing a livable wage or other employee benefits. You know, I, I don't know the best way to frame that. 
but just kind of, you know, livable wage, paid time off, you know, a whole list of other things. Um, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be those two. And in this, it kind of seems like it is just those two. Mm -hmm. Like flexible work hours. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I didn't think it would, it would ever be just this two, but I, but I do realize that we've only listed these two. I mean, I think we could take out paid leave and just leave a whole wage. I or think that. the like the flexible time, those, I mean, I think businesses end up having to do that to compete for employees, especially okay. right now. Mm -hmm. I just was thinking when I was looking at this in relation to that comment, um, a whole wage is not required of businesses, but paid leave and health insurance are. So it's not that we want them to, the yeah. point of this is not for them to comply with what already exists. It's for them to do something extra, right? Yeah, it's acknowledging that minimum wage and livable wage are not necessarily the same thing. Is there a definition of livable wage? The JFO has a, has a livable okay. wage calculation. flexible take into account someone's like status as in like if you're a single mother a little wage is different than if you're a teenager. I don't do I don't remember what they use in the calculation it's certain benefits and okay. all right well if there's a definition housing somewhere yeah these people have some time yeah uh next comment recommends that the rule clarify that livable wage does not include the value of samples, clothing, or other product provided to employees. I feel like we dealt with that somewhere else. The employee benefits. We did talk about it. It's okay. somewhere in here. We did. <laughs> Where sampling couldn't be considered in, a benefit. Did we put it in the rule? I I remember we talked about it somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, I think too. But it was probably not specific to this, and maybe we should make it specific to this. Yeah, I think it was in the January 15th report that Brandon. Okay. Maybe. No. I know it was there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not sure if it's in the rule. We all agree that that's not what we mean by correct livable wage. Yes. I don't think it's in the rule. Sorry. Um, so, do we want to clarify or sort of rely on the? The definition, definition of what the boys that already exists. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Do you want to hear the statutory definition of it? Yeah. That'd be helpful. Um, the hourly wage required for a full time worker to pay for one half of the basic needs budget for a two person household with no children. And employer sponsored health insurance, average for both urban and rural areas, 1339 and up. 1339. And the current minimum wage is like 1250 or something like that. Okay. There's a, and there's nothing in there about cannabis samples. <laughs> there's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I <can't> believe <laughs> I missed that. Um, Somebody recommends on 1.4.9 C3 that you add workforce reentry programming. Yeah, I mean, it's including but not limited to, but that's fine. Okay. On 1.4.9 C4, should the word including be removed? That's a uh, third word in that clause. Is the intent just for contributions to the Cannabis Business Development Fund? Is the intent to limit it, or sorry, is the intent to just be for contributions to the Cannabis Business Development Fund, or are there other community contributions allowed? If so, should the parameters be defined uh, in order to avoid issues like parameters in terms of who is an acceptable entity to contribute to and what level of contribution? Well, so here we have, if you look at the language and see, it says applicants must propose plans 
um, to do these things. One of the plans is community reinvestment. Um, so we actually have some discretion to say, um, you know, a contribution to, you know, some made up charity doesn't count. People's funds. Um, you know, so I think, I don't think we necessarily need to get more specific on community reinvestment in, in rule. Um, what we could decide is it's just contributions to the cannabis, cannabis to business development fund. That makes things slightly easier. And also it's not as far reaching, you know, potentially, um, cause you know, that's somewhat limited, but it's all, there's also a nexus to what we're trying to do. So in some ways that's good. Um, I also think that if the option is invest to a nonprofit that focuses on community reinvestment versus invest in the cannabis business development fund, one is tax deductible, the other is not, that no one's going to choose the non-tax deductible version. So maybe we just want to push people towards the business development. Funds. Yeah, I think that would be great when we've identified that as underfunded and that would be an option for one way for it to get funding with the community reinvestment something that you said um you know the made-up charity well who who does who does the looking to find out if it's a made-up charity right. like who on the staff is responsible for figuring right. that out yeah. all right so we'll eliminate community reinvestment um and i i know that this commenter wants us to get specific about how much is that right they asked about that yeah what, what level is acceptable? <laughs> it's gonna vary from like, like, could it be a dollar? Like what, well, what, is I, there a minimum? So we, there has to be, the applicant has to propose a plan. You know, I don't, I just don't know. I don't know the answer. You know, I think it's gotta look, it's gotta on its face be a uh, good faith, good yeah. faith yeah. contribution, you know. Like a percentage of profits capped at a certain amount or something. I just don't know what that number is. So, is this something that we could address in the guidance that we give? Yeah, I mean, that's what Massachusetts does. Okay. okay, so we'll just leave it as limited to the business development fund amounts will sort of be determined by policy and probably as we as you accept plans you'll make assessments on a case-by-case -case basis is my, my guess yeah. um commenter says on 1.4.9 d about carbon offsets carbon offsets and market carbon markets more broadly are rarely legitimate means of reducing pollution and equitably affecting climate change pollution must be reduced at its source and we must also increase car a carbon positive activities such as particular forms of agroecology and regenerative agriculture. Allowing pollution to continue in exchange for improved outcomes in other areas, carbon offsets and markets, quote unquote net zero, does not lead towards our climate change or policy or pollution mitigation goals, rather it perpetuates the problems of pollution and inequity we face. That is that is the whole comment. <clears throat> I take that I would take that as a recommendation to remove carbon offsets, but that's for your discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with the commenter here. Um, and carbon offsets and carbon markets, generally speaking, do have a mixed bag of success, but I think they've gotten more nuanced. They're not just slush funds that you pay into, because um, that would inevitably be a tax, which there's been cases to lay out how these kind of effectively work in other jurisdictions. I think you know, um, you're always at the same time, unless you're in like a deregulated energy grid style system, you don't get to choose where your energy comes from. You're still, and it, it's unique to Vermont, but it, or that's not unique to Vermont, but I know we don't have, in other bigger states, you know, there's still coal fired power plants, so on and so forth. You don't get to pick where your energy is being sourced from unless you have the means to go fully renewable through solar or wind or, you know, cogen or, whatever the case may be. And I think there should be an opportunity to help back in some of that, you know, stress or, or 
good nature, big good faith effort that you want to do elsewhere. I think that this comment also doesn't recognize that there is other kind of on the flip side of that, you know, um, you know, and I'm thinking about it in, in the context of hemp because there's a lot more studies to this point done on hemp than high THC cannabis, but I'll use it as a proxy for the conversation since it's the same plant. You know, hemp is really good at sequestering carbon. It can sequester like 16 tons of carbon per acre, better than woody biomass, meaning trees that are sequestering carbon. Um, it's a good cover crop. There's state programs like payment for ecosystem services. There's, there's, op, there's, there's ways that farmers, um, again, I'm using the word farmer broadly here, um, can receive payment for a premium on their products based on the agricultural techniques or methods that they're using to grow their their crop. And there's certain folks that will pay a premium for that. I also think, you know, and it's my understanding that at the federal level, and again, I'm going to use hemp as, a, as the context here, the Trump administration put billions of dollars into what's called the Commodity Credit Corporation, which helps the commodity groups, it, it kind of helped them stay afloat during during COVID, but I know the Biden administration is really looking to create um, a carbon bank with that money that will help, you know, incentivize a lot more uh, carbon trading to happen at the national level. And we're not there yet, obviously, in this context, but if this does get federally legalized, depending on how it's regulated at the federal level, um, it could mean certain folks would be eligible to participate in those types of programs. I know a lot of that at the federal level has support from everybody from American Farm Bureau to the Environmental Defense Fund and Nature Conservancy. So all that goes to say that I don't think carbon offsets or carbon markets are completely out of the question for the direction that a lot of folks from the UN to the federal government to certain states and private market operators, you know, to go down. Um, I appreciate the comment. It's not the cleanest path to um, improving our environmental footprint, but it provides options for folks that otherwise can't do so on their site-specific place. Is there any kind of play in the joints of the earlier part of the sentence, which is contribute to anti-pollution efforts? Like, we think that, I guess we would approve the plan, but like investing in a like fracking company might be considered anti-pollution because natural gas is a cleaner energy source than coal. I don't want to get into the fracking conversation. <laughs> that's a method. <laughs> that's a, that's a, yeah. just a, a method for extracting natural gas. Um, you know, I think, you know, we'll still look at what they're intending to do, but I think removing it completely from somebody's ability, um, I, I wouldn't be in, in support of that. I just think fundamentally where your site specific plan is, you're only limited to doing certain amount of things, especially if you're a retail establishment in a, in a commercially zoned area of a, of a specific town. What kind of options do you fundamentally have to do certain things on your site specific area versus being able to help facilitate change elsewhere that kind of all make up our broader pollution diet? That's my, you know, thoughts around carbon markets, you know, I think the devil's always in the details with them. Um, again, there's been a mixed bag of success. I think limiting it to, you know, and they're using, they say carbon positive activities. I think they mean carbon negative activities. That's the terminology that's typically used referring to these types of programs. So um, I would just say we leave it as is. All right. Okay. Uh, So then skipping ahead to um, 1.5.2 is our next comment. <clears throat> this is the wastewater and wastewater requirements section. And the commenter says, uh, we don't have a specific recommendation, rather a question as to how burdensome this requirement may be depending on a local utility certifier, whether they're timely in responding, how they exercise their discretion and so forth and whether this leaves room for further discrimination against cannabis establishments in general, as well as communities already facing bias and systemic discrimination. You know, I, I, we put this, or the Sustainability Committee recommended that this be part of the conversation. Um, local utility operators are not all too unfamiliar with, with doing this for other commercial business activities. They also do it for the current medical dispensaries. Um, and prospective integrated license holders. Timeline from, you know, getting that approval from a local utility um, 
from first contact to getting it. It's my understanding that it's um, it's relatively quick. Like it's it's not going to be a burden um, as long as you make the effort. Mm -hmm. I feel like we've heard testimony on that like yeah. months and months ago about how quick it was to get the it's, letter back, right? Yeah, and I mean yeah. we've got language everywhere. We might want to make sure it applies specifically to this, where you can't treat a cannabis business any different than any other commercial business. Um, I would imagine that same line of thought applies to utility operators. I also just don't see the scale of which we're operating really being th this is something that it should happen. It's not going to be there's not going to be a lot of hard decisions based on my talks with A&R and um, those that provide that through them, the, util the local utilities that actually do these letters, these sort of fine letters. We waived this for home occupation. home occupation, right? So if you're a home occupancy, this 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 section's waived. I don't feel comfortable going any further than that. I don't no. think it will lead to further discrimination. Yeah. And if it does, we'll, you know, uh, I, I mean, I'm not even, so. yeah, you know, so I don't think we need to make any further adjustments there. All right. Uh, moving on to 1.5.3, commenter asks, what happens with on-site septic? And just to say 1.5.3 is about indoor cultivators uh, identifying whether their water supply must comply with uh, DEC's, some of DEC's rules, just sorry, Department of Environmental Conservation's rules. And so the commenter asks, what happens with on-site septic? Does the board need information that on-site septic or wastewater drainage can support cultivation or would that be included with a local permitting process? That would be included with, to me, a local permitting process, or if you, you know, there's certain triggers that might make you need to reach out to DEC through ANR, and they've got the expertise there. So that's just us working with state partners. Yeah. Then going to 1.7, which is uh, license application requirements for retailers. Somebody basically just made the argument that uh, we should limit the number of retail stores to provide. I don't think we should at this point in time. Limit the number of retail, or is this like a retail density problem? Either way, I don't think we have much control over it. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the commenters was making both points. And said they didn't like density, but also just asked for a limit overall. So, yeah. okay. To me, just with license caps, it creates um, kind of a secondary value to these licenses. Right. That I just I don't like the idea of there being a license fee, but then there's also kind of this <laughs> monopolistic dynamic happening. So, um, there may come a time where we need to kind of close specific license type application windows for various reasons, but I don't think that we should set some sort of hard cap on the number of retail stores. Yep. Right. Yeah. Um, on section 1.8, we would like clarity from the board related to these unique privileges being proposed for testing laboratories. Why would the licensing requirements or fees be waived? Have the fees potentially already been paid to another state program, for example. I think that was the idea. Yeah, that was the yeah. idea. As in, they're already, they've already paid for their cannabis license certification to the Agency of Agriculture, and they're testing the exact same plant for the exact same things. Why do they have to double pay that fee? Yeah, and I mean, some licenses are only right now accredited through the agency of ag to do certain parts of what will be a full panel test so we can waive the specific you know whether it's thc percentage or whatever the case may be thc content but we don't need to waive things that they haven't already sought accreditation for from a specific testing perspective right yeah right um going to 1.9 uh, 1.9a, subsection A specifically, the commenter asks, uh, or requests rather, that the board remove free cannabis, quote unquote, free cannabis as an option, 
because the medical dispensaries are already required to provide a sliding scale fee system. The dispensaries already offer significantly discounted product and do so at a cost to their business. We recommend continuing the sliding scale fee system as it has clear requirements and qualifications that have been in place for years. <clears throat> okay. I would say sliding scale, they can't go down to zero. Sliding scale. I mean, I just don't get the purpose. I think I think it's fine the way it is. Yeah, everyone, you're right over there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, moving on to license application periods, section one point ten. Um, number of comments here, mostly about the sort of uh, acceptance period, the windows and so forth. So let's go through these. Subsection D, what happens in the one month window? Is there a time limit for when day applications need to be completed? What if it isn't completed until after the one month window? Uh, I would just note that um, the board under this same section does have to provide 30 days of notice. So licensee would have, or a applicant, I should say, would have 60 days to complete an application. Um, but, it, you know, you can discuss changing the windows, changing the notification, whatever, if, if you want. So the window is spelled out in the statute, right? The initial, so the beginning of the section says the board will accept license applications in accordance with legislatively mandated time period. So the initial acceptance period is laid out in statute, but after that, you have complete discretion to set windows as important. And what it lays out in statute is that it has to stay open for a certain amount of time. It doesn't say that it has to close. That's right. So again, this to me is just a staffing issue um, and kind of a needs of the market issue. Uh, so, right, if we, I mean, we may never close the small cultivator, uh, window. Um, I don't see why we would, honestly, um, unless it's just, they're just so swamped with other applications that we have to kind of focus on some other stuff first, but, um. Well, so I just want to understand, we give 30 days prior to opening or closing. So either if we open it. If we intend to close it within 30 days, we'd have to say that at the start, right? right? Yep. Or you could end up having 90 days or 120 days because we'd have, if we leave it open, right. like you're suggesting, then we have to give 30 days notice before we actually close it. Right. So it could be quite a while that somebody has to do an application. I'm not, I don't think we need to change I don't it. think we need to change anything here. Uh, If someone's because I mean, they're the thing is, is they're tying it. This comment is tied to a one month window, and I just don't really see. I don't, I just don't really see us really having one month windows, but maybe future boards will. Maybe, um, but again, they would have to notice that they're planning on closing, you know, 30 days before opening essentially, or that you, you notice that you're going to open within and then you have 30 days notice. And then you could say the day that it opens, we're going to close it in 30 days. Right. And then everyone kind of is on the same playing field. Right. So, all right. Yeah, I don't see any real reason to change this based on the comment. Okay. Well, nope, I'm good. Um, so moving to subsection D2, a couple commenters requested that the annual application period be required to open for all cultivator tiers, not just tiers one and two. Would we have to do that so people can scale up? Do we have to open? I think that's the only. I think we, I mean our intent was to make sure that regardless of market demand, we still provide an opportunity for small cultivators no matter what. I think that's the only right. point on the other side of the equation. You know. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the, the fear here is that, you know, some future board has all license types closed, except for one and two for 30 days every year. And then someone, you know, is so. a tier two and needs to become a tier three. And the board one could do that if they opened that window. Uh, but then they'd have to do it within, they'd have to give 30 days notice. They're not required to open it. They're not required. I don't know. I just have a feeling these, I just have a feeling that these windows are going to remain open. You know, I think this is a fail safe for future boards that don't want to open windows. Yeah, I mean, looking through the comments on this section, I think folks are afraid that we're not going to operate on a rolling basis. I don't think that's our intent. I think it's making sure that there is windows open regardless of market demand for the future. But if you look at our nearest neighbor, for example, in Massachusetts, I mean, they're constantly approving new provisional licenses and new licenses constantly. So it's, I think I agree with you, Pepper. I think it's unlikely that we're going to not have to have anything other than a pretty rolling period application. So no change? No change. Yeah, no change. I think the commenters are just looking at it from the opposite right. end of how we're trying to, you know, explain our rationale, which is fine, but I think we're good. Yeah. Um, so this person is saying that the next comment talks about the 30 day period, saying that they are feel it's overly restrictive. Uh, they say ideally there would be an ongoing application period for licenses. Um, it's important to consider particular time seasons in which cultivation licenses are due for renewal outdoor in particular. Um, and, you know, they'll need to have approval very early in the calendar year. I mean, I think this is similar to what you were just saying in the sense that this provision was not to allow you to close things down. Your intention is to keep things open. It was to prevent a future board from completely shutting down. Market. So it sort of was a constraining a future board, but not so much a signal about what you were planning to do. So I guess, you know, just the only thing to consider here is do we want to get more prescriptive uh, in the rule about when the 30 day mandatory opening period should be in order to ensure that outdoor, outdoor cultivation uh, at least has a shot, at least has a shot of getting licensed that year and using it that year. Yeah, uh, no, I think so that's the one. Maybe we say in February, you know, it will open. Yeah. You know, for the board shall accept applications for no less than 30 days each calendar year. You know. Applications must open February. February. For all of them. Start, or just starting in February. Yeah. Starting February first. 30 day window starting February first. Yeah. That at least gets the whole process done for small cultivators that are operating outdoor to get plants in the ground when they need to. Okay. Um, so I believe this comment, the next comment was saying that the license, they were nervous that the license renewal was somehow tied into the application acceptance periods, which I I don't think was the intention. I actually think the commenter understood that it wasn't the intention. They just wanted to be clear that, in fact, it was not, there wasn't going to be a tie between here. In other words, if you've got a license, you can renew it yearly as long as you meet the renewal requirements. Yeah, I think it's new licenses. This is no, yeah, new application. Boards can't wind down the market. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll look to see if there's a simple way to clarify that, but yeah. I think there's nothing in here that says this has anything to do with license renewal. So I wouldn't think that a future board will use this to shut down that process. All right, going ahead to uh, 1.11. This is the criminal records piece. So a number of comments on here. Um, so I'm going to read through one comment that 
comes with several recommendations. So the commenter notes that the statutory uh, provision that gives you the power to look at these things says that the board's discretion to deny license applications due to an applicant's criminal history uh, it's limited to those situations where the applicant's criminal record reveals, quote, factors that demonstrate whether the applicant presently poses a threat to public safety or the proper to functioning of the regulated market, end quote. And further, uh, specifically excludes nonviolent drug offenses, talking about the statute. Um, the commenter says that this section or the following section 1.1.12 is not sufficiently tailored to the statutory limitation. It creates a presumptive disqualification for all, oh, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. The commenter is referring to multiple subsections within 1.11. Uh, unfortunately, 1.11.2 uh, is not sufficiently tailored to the statutory limitation and creates a presumptive disqualification for all misdemeanors occurring within the last two years, all felonies occurring within the last five, uh, and all felonies at any time involving fraud, deceit, or embezzlement. Uh, without regard to whether the crimes demonstrate a present threat to public safety or the proper function of the regulated market. Uh, while Section uh, 1.11.13 does allow an applicant to overcome the presumption, presumptive disqualification by presenting mitigating factors, requiring an applicant to present such factors to overcome a disqualification turns on its head the express statutory requirement that disqualifications only be based on factors that demonstrate those threats in the first place. Separately, the legislative intent in denying applications on threats to proper function was in part based on the coal memorandum second priority, which is preventing revenues from the sale of marijuana from ongoing criminal enterprises, gangs, or cartels, end quote. While too restrictive in other respects, 1.11.12 fails to squarely disqualify applicants based on factors that demonstrate an ongoing involvement in such criminal enterprise. So there are four recommendations all within the same comment. Um, I think it makes sense to go at them one at a time. Uh, place a time limit on 1.11.2, right? Yes, place a time limit on 1.11.2B of no more than 10 years and expressly exclude money laundering offenses which were charged as is very common in connection with trafficking cannabis and any other nonviolent drug offenses. I don't think that's a good idea. Again, we have this section, and I'm willing actually to accept one of the other recommendations here that will make this even broader or let more restrictive, I should say. But this is the most permissive use of criminal histories in cannabis in any state. And um, anything that is tied to money laundering it's important for us to know, and nothing, nothing is permanently disqualifying. Everything can be overcome based upon the circumstances. So um, I really, when it comes to money laundering specifically, um, I think we need to take a closer look at it. If nothing else, to make sure that all of our financial institutions and our federal partners know that we've kind of signed off on every crime that could implicate a FinCEN, but, you know, violation. So, Agreed. All right. Okay. Second uh, recommendation still in the same comment is to exclude all nonviolent misdemeanors, which do not involve fraud, deceit, or embezzlement, and all nonviolent felony uh, from 1.11.2 E and F, so the bottom two subsections of that. Um, Right, so just that's that's the recommendation. It current both of those currently exclude only exclude nonviolent drug offenses. The recommendation is to change it to all nonviolent offenses. So this is the one where I, I think I'm okay with this. However, I can say the reason why I chose the phrase nonviolent drug offenses was because that's what the statute said specifically. So when you know this commenter's talking about what the legislative intent was, you know, it's really hard to absent kind of express language to really determine what a legislative intent is because there's 181 people that get to decide this for 181 different reasons. Um, but um, that being said, I think I'm all right because I'm trying to think about what 
specifically nonviolent misdemeanors or felonies, I would think would preclude someone. And the, I mean, the most intense ones, David and I kind of had a conversation about this, are really like the luring statutes, um, the luring crimes. Um, you know, those are serious crimes. Uh, but if they're five years and older and there's no subsequent convictions and you know, does it really implicate someone's ability to grow and sell cannabis? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Essentially, the question is, should we eliminate the word drug from um, E and F? And your thought is yes? You, I mean, I'd be, obviously, I'd be more comfortable with doing it in E and not F. Um, doing it for misdemeanors and not felonies. Um, and again, like, then it just comes down to us evaluating on a case by case basis whether or not this person poses a present risk based upon the factors in the next section. I don't know. I, I, I'm honestly like, I've thought a lot about this. Uh, I've had conversations. Um, you know, this is David Silverman's request. Um, He's spent a lot of time thinking about this section as well. I agree with that. Yeah. E and F or just E? So my my understanding of you know this part of the criminal justice system system is limited. So I'm just I'm trusting you. <laughs> So I think you said E, but not F, right? That's, I, I mean, you know, I'm on the fence about, about F. I think I, I'm, I'm copacetic with E. I'm, just, I'm a little bit on the fence about F, but honestly, I could probably go F as well. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a place where I follow you as well. Um, but I would, I think ENF, something we can do. All right, as long as you're, I know there's varying levels of comfort, but I mean, yeah. essentially, you know, the really serious nonviolent felony convictions are mostly for property crimes. Right. You know, and we've already got the kind of FinCEN, you know, the property crimes that implicate the proper functioning market already are kind of not, are presumptively disqualified. So what are we really talking about? You know, I think like DUI death resulting, something like that. Um, that might be a list of, oh. <clears throat> is, that a, is that a list? I think it's a list of, okay. So like DUI with serious property damage, you know, is that, is that something we care about if it happened within the last five years? Do we need to know that? Do we want to review that application with the kind of under the kind of 1.3 criteria? If someone was drunk and drove in house. into someone's house, I don't think I need to know that. In the last five years? Within, in the, last within five. the last five years? Yeah, because we're already saying if it happened five years ago, that yeah. we're going to treat it as if it never happens. No, probably not. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's the the luring one is the one where you're you know trying to entice an underage person to for sexual assault. I, I mean, that's that's, that's what we're <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's I think considered a nonviolent offense. But so. I think I'd be comfortable with ENF. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's eliminate drug from the word drug from what we have. All right. The next recommendation is to create an express dis presumptive disqualification for recent criminal records that demonstrate an ongoing involvement with organized criminal enterprises, including violent gangs and drug cartels. And this is in reference to the um, uh, call memorandum provision that the commenter cites. Earlier. Do we know what those 
crimes would be like conspiracy charges like what i mean how do we even like you know quantify that into i, I think this terminology maps much more closely onto federal charges where you have much more common like rico charges like and things like that yeah. organized crime type charges um and you know people could certainly apply to work in the market who have those types of charges uh in vermont so it may be one of those things where there it's it there aren't that many Vermont specific crimes where you would be able to identify that this is the type of activity, but there are other, there are federal charges or charges from other state where it would more clearly fit within these categories. So I'm fine with that. If you, if you feel like you can translate that into a rule, <laughs> I'll, I'll do the best I can. Um, the final, uh, Recommendations go in the same comment in subsection one point or sorry, section one point eleven point three require as opposed to simply allowing the board to request additional information to overcome a presumptive disqualification and to place an application in pending status, pending receipt thereof from the applicant. So the applicant has a meaningful opportunity to respond when the application window would otherwise close. Um, we talked about this at the time, requiring someone to kind of talk about this when right. almost everything here is just factual that we're going to get from the criminal history record anyway, you know, dragging someone in or making them submit a comment when, again when they don't want to, uh, to me is just silly. Um, you know, nothing would prohibit them from making a comment if they wanted to. I don't, I don't agree with this recommendation. Does that make sense? Um, yes, although I have a question. So yeah. they, you can overcome, how are we, how do people overcome? So the it's the 11.3, it's the nature and seriousness of the crime, yeah. whether it was kind of a isolated incident or kind of a repeated behavior. Um, the age of the person when the crime was committed, any subsequent offenses, so oh. the, the like social conditions might be an no, area. This is the answer to my question. Sorry. Okay. This, yeah. The license application will allow applicants to provide additional information. That right. was how are we getting the information was was really my question. Yeah. So. And I got it. Yeah. I think it'd be one of those things where you know you, you can explain explain the circumstances if you want to. If you don't want to, then we just don't include. We don't consider it. Yeah. And we just consider the other factors. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, so another comment, uh, I'd say a little more broadly about the, this section 1.11 that came in is that we feel that the CCB has defined an overly broad net of criminal history, which would lead to presumptive disqualification. And although the CCB has left room for overcoming presumptive disqualification, this process is fundamentally inverted. Presuming guilt of someone with a past criminal history and asking them to effectively prove their innocence and the validity of their rehabilitation to another government entity in order to run a legal business with substantial oversight and regulation. Um, that last clause was long, but I think mm -hmm. it, it was just saying that they don't agree with that approach to uh, dealing with criminal history records. Yeah, we're not requiring anyone to prove their innocence here. That's not what this is about. It's really proving that they're not going to disrupt the market in a way that's prohibited. So I, I just, you know, we're being very, we're being very loose on criminal history records based on this compared to other states, I should say. Um, and we're giving everyone an opportunity to, we're going to consider everyone potentially viable. You know, someone might be presumptively disqualified, but we—it's easy enough to overcome that. So I—I I just don't agree with this comment. The way this is set up really allows someone to give more information than we would get in their background check, right. which we could just make a determination based on what's written on the page, right. which doesn't really tell the story. Right. 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 Yeah. So I—I I don't think we need further discussion on this comment. All right. Um. Moving to section 1.12, this is the issuance of licenses. Uh, two recommendations here. One is to add a bad actor provision so that somebody with a revocation pursuant to rule four, in other words, 
did something wrong, board revokes your license under our uh, compliance and enforcement rule, which is rule four. So add a provision saying that somebody to whom that happens must wait for a year or some amount of time before reapplying for a license. Why would that? Do we need to get super specific on you can't be in control? You can't be, you know. Right. Can you, you can't be, be a financier or anything? Right. Yeah. Someone else is kind of, you do not have to write that. It's like you you can't be a license holder or be an owner of a. Entity. Yeah, that can be. Yeah, let me just add a note here. In one year, sounds unsuitable. The next uh, recommendation I would say is more in the nature of a drafting note. Yeah, the drafting note. There should be a provision added to clarify that a licensing grant or denial constitutes a final decision of the board for the purposes of appeals pursuant to the statutory section that deals with appeals in our in our statutes. I think this from the lawyer standpoint, I do think this makes sense. Um, we need to be clear that this is a triggering point for an appeal, that there isn't an internal appeal process for a license grant or denials. The license grant or denial is the final decision. That's the triggering point for going into the administrative law process. That's good. Um, going on to 1.13. Uh, potentially renamed provisional licenses to something like pre qualification accru approval. Uh, the term provisional licensing can be confusing because it sounds like someone can get a license and start operating on an interim basis, which the section says that you can't, but the name arguably makes it sound like you could. So that's the comment. I mean, I kind of like it only because, you know, someone having a license, you know, or us calling it that gives people the impression that they do have a license when really all we're saying is, you know, this at this point in time, this these people are will not be categorically disqualified from getting a license you know it's it's kind of like you know so to me pre-qualification approval is actually closer to what we're what we're saying it's not really a license i know it's all in some ways semantics right but will a financial institution reflect more you know um or reflect better upon the word of a provisional license or a pre-qualification approval. That's kind of where my head's at. Is yeah. it going to matter to them in, in terms of the wording that's that's used? Or getting a lease or any of the right. other. So I can tell you that in the two banking roundtables I've had, they, the financial institutions like the approach. I don't think they care what we okay. call it. Um, I figured as much. I just wanted to make sure that, <laughs> that, that we weren't, it wasn't a yeah. super semantic oversight. It helps, it helps them kind of decide at one point they need to start engaging with this company so is, you know if they have a piece of paper that says they're pre-approved or that it's a professional license <laughs> yeah they're, they're not going to care quite as much yeah. the only thing you know i get notifications that i'm pre-qualified for yeah. <laughs> credit cards all the time not necessarily <laughs> the case you know um good on that i think we're good all right great That's i'm going to keep <laughs> Saying the term provisional license just because that's how it's written for now, but we'll change it uh, in the redraft here. Uh, so next comment is on 1.13.1. A comment they're asking the board open slash reopen the provisional license process at any time. Can applicants apply for a provisional license anytime? And I think this is actually provided for in uh, where was it? 1.13.4, where it basically lays out that the board can open and close at its discretion, similar to the except experience for the regular licensing. So is there something that needs to connect 1.13.4 to 1 point? Is it N where we have the. So if we if the board has to open certain licenses for, for every year. Do they also have to open the provisional license process? Does that come with it right now? It doesn't say that. I think this is really at the board's discretion if they want to give this sort of offer this up as a possibility. 
think of financial institutions need this type of signaling that a well qualified applicant. How do we not provide some type of provisional or pre qualification process for all prospective new license holders? That's just a question. Uh, yeah, and it really only matters if we at some point close the application process right. and need to reopen it, right? Otherwise, we would just assume that both the provisional process and the licensing process are open. And rolling. Right. Yeah, I know. It's. I was just your question made me think. Like, what if someone applies for a provisional license uh, for a license type that we don't have, or we're never going to intend to open? Like, uh, 25,000 square foot, you know, if, if we decide that the whole market can be satisfied by the, lo the lower tiers, I mean, I guess we would just deny it, deny yeah. the provisional license mm -hmm. application. So I don't think the window necessarily has to be open, but I think, you know, it would be a denial if the wind, if, if someone applied for a provisional license for a tier that we had no intention of opening. I think we would deny and refund. Okay. But do we need the provisional license for like the 30 day small cultivator window? Like the provisional license for that license type, if they're going to be opening February 1st, the provisional license needs to open by X date. I don't know. So, based on this, the board doesn't have to open the provisional process. It only has to open the licensing process. Yeah. But if we know that folks need a provisional license to go get a bank account, let's say, or or other get a lease or what have you, do we always have to open the provisional license too? I think is the question that I have. Yeah, I mean, really, like, or will like lending institutions once this market is been open yeah. become a little bit more? And I mean, that's not a question. <laughs> Maybe, you know, through the banking round table, yeah. but once we've reached maturity, will they feel a little bit more confident in working with somebody before they get a pre-qualification or a provisional license? Yes. It really comes down to the financial institutions in this state, particularly, don't know what to expect. Um, they don't know how many applications they're going to receive. They don't know, you know, at what levels, whether it's going to be a request to just open a bank account or you know, some other lending possibility. They they just want as much of the work done by us uh, first. <laughs> to come to so so the, the people that they're dealing with actually have a legitimate shot at actually opening a business. Um, or they won't be denied by us, if, you know, so the whole, you know, the whole, their whole effort was wasted. Um, so it helps them to see something like a provisional license because it shows some real you know, intent and some approval by some authority, uh, but they don't need it. I mean, there's nothing that would require them, a financial institution, to look at one of these, you know, to, to demand a provision. And, and you think once they get used to working in this specific market, they right. might be less inclined to feel the need for that over time, I guess. That's right. I'll wait up. You are going to be looking over the next next day or whatever, two days, uh, about the question about how much in other states there's been any bottlenecks in terms of insurance, bank accounts, things like that. And that might inform this discussion about whether you also need to provide assurance that provisional or whatever we're going to call pre-qualification is necessary. If it turns out that as a practical matter in other states, everything's been going okay, uh, getting stuff before licensing, then this matters less. So no, I would say to this comment, we don't need to is it ensure that there's a provisional licensing window open like we do in the other rule. Is that what this is asking for? Yeah. Yeah. And that just, you know, I think the rules are pretty clear that we have discretion to not grant a provisional license. So if you know, someone can apply at any time, but if it's for a cultivation tier that we never intend to open or have no plans on opening, we would just deny. You should it. tell them, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not going to be like a rush to the starting line for the highest tier if right. you have to get a provisional license with the hopes that it opens one day and you have a fast track. So, are we good for now on that? Yeah. Um, looking to 1.14. 
which is the priority board considerations for license applications. Um, comment says, should the details of priority processing be outlined in the rules? The board must open up licenses annually. This process will likely be needed each time licensing is opened. Um, and, you know, this is in the rule uh, because it's required by statute. I think uh, given some of the complexities about how this will roll out, it, the decision was that it made sense to allow for that to be developed in guidance and additionally made sense because this will change as the market is up and running. The initial acceptance period is going to be a big bunch of licenses all at once, and after that it will be a rolling basis, which will make for a very different system. Yeah. Okay, so we don't really need to do anything with this. I think it's better to stay put where we are. Can I just ask? So the 903 says that we will create a system of prioritization by rule, and just because this is going to go somewhere else, and they're going to look at it, right? Tell us whether or not we've met the intent. We all feel like this this section meets that intent of that requirement on us. That's our argument. Okay. Yeah. All right. Going to 1.15 license renewal time frame, or no, license renewal procedures in general. Um, so I think we actually already dealt with this. Um, because we already talked about the license uh, tier change, which kind of implicates this too. But anyway, first comment on the section in general is we'll, the rule should allow a licensee the ability to move to a new location and pay a relocation fee. Um, we didn't talk about a relocation fee, but we did already talk about the notion of changing tiers and potentially changing locations. So I think based on that conversation, that piece will be allowed. You guys can discuss relocation fee if you'd like. You know, one, we can't just set a fee, so this would have to be included in the fee bill, um, I think, um, unless we just treat it as if you're moving locations, it's a new license and you have to just reapply. Seems a little bit harsh, but again, like if we've already assumed the cost of going to inspect the place and someone changes their location and we have to go inspect again, you know, that's what the fee pays for is the inspection and the compliance. So in some ways, you know, I feel like if you're going to change locations, you should probably try and, you know, just have the foresight to do it within your license window or understand that you're going to lose a portion of your fee, essentially. Is there any just thinking about different scenarios, how this might play out? What if you have a landlord that's kicking you out? because they don't want a cannabis business operating on their premises anymore. Do we want to make any special, I'm not saying we need to, but I'm just thinking about different ways that this specific issue or the building may come is, up where it's not yeah. somebody making a business decision. It's, it's more about a decision that's been put on the license holder. Yeah, we do have, if there's a change of ownership that we can waive the fee. So maybe we do the same language here. Right, like what if there's, what, what if the building burns down or yeah. some sort of tragedy? Yeah. yeah. So maybe it's just. A change of location that's not. A change of location, we do the exact same way as a change of ownership. Okay. See some uh, folks not wanting to, or landlords. We, it's it's going to be a mixed bag, I think, you know. Well, if a building sells, the new landlord might have different plans. Yeah, or if that person finds himself in a predatory cannabis tax kind of relationship and they're like, I need to get out of here. Like, this, this is somebody's holding so, me hostage, you know? Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, so essentially it'll be, it requires a license renewal. If you're going to change location, let's say not at the, you can change location at the renewal. If it's not at the normal renewal time, we'll say it's similar to the change of control, except obviously the change of control provisions that are specifically relevant to change of control, we wouldn't apply to this. It would just be... Updating location information. Okay, great. So you update location information. Pay, you pay the fee, but the fee can be waived by the board, right? Yeah, that's the same as change of control. Okay. Uh, hang 
on one second. Okay. Next comment is specific to 1.15.1 license renewal timeframes. <clears throat> The commenter says we are asking the CCB to allow integrated licenses to renew medical and adult use at the same time to maximize efficiency. Renewals are time consuming and require the review of large quantity of documents. The integrated licensees, licenses be allowed to renew medical and adult use simultaneously. They will save significant amounts of time. What's preventing them from lining that up themselves? Uh, my rhetorical <laughs> Know that they're on a schedule now. Um, I guess the, the question is in year one, they're not going to, you know, there's a lot of folks that have to renew in February. And there's some of the dispensaries have to renew in February, so they can't line it up. But next year, I could, right? Yeah, I mean, base, I guess you could explicitly provide that. The integrated licensees, their dispensary portion of their operation. Well, I'm thinking out loud a little here, which yeah. is always dangerous. Welcome to our party. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I think my read would be that once they have an integrated license, that covers all of their operations and they don't need to have a separate renewal. And I believe that Rule 3 explicitly says this. I will check it before we are done with Rule 1 and 2. Uh, I believe it provides that once you get the integrated license, you're like out of the dispensary specific regulations entirely. And now you, you can still run a dispensary operation, but you've got to abide by all the rule one and two stuff that applies with respect to license renewal and so forth. So effectively, I guess what I'm saying is they're going to get exactly what they're asking for as soon as they become an integrated licensee. I was going to say that that was my kind of thought on how things would roll after year one, regardless. That, Man. that makes sense from a practical standpoint. That means from a fee standpoint and the separate funds that exist that pay for the medical program versus pay for our operations. You're saying that the integrated license essentially includes a dispensary license? Essentially, yeah. It allows them to they operate as dispensary. Just write two separate checks when they pay, when they apply for that integrated license. Like one to the medical registry fund and one to the CCB fund. Yeah, I mean the rule only says that because we can't set fees. The rules pretty much always just say you've got to pay the fees as laid out. So I think the answer is yes. It'll just be whatever fees apply that the legislature's assigned will still be applicable. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's just this thing out there, this concern that. Those funds will be commingled, and that mm -hmm. you know, I, I actually think that there's probably some reasons why our program might end up subsidizing a medical program, but fear currently is that it would be the other way around. So, right. so we'll we'll make any specific changes here, but I will note for when we get back to Rule Three that we need to be clear about that the issue at least. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so then moving on to 1.15.2. This is the change of control section. And the first comment is about terminology with respect to when you have to um, submit this information. And uh, yeah, anyway, I'll just read it. This requires a licensee to apply for renewal prior to, quote, executing, unquote, a change of control transaction. The choice of words is unclear and suggests that the board may be requiring a renewal, a renewal application prior to a licensee signing an agreement that would affect a change in control. This may have an unduly chilling effect on both fundraising and exit transactions, wherein the public interest lies in ensuring the change of control transaction is not consummated rather than executed without the board's approval. And the recommendation from the commenter has replaced the word executing with the word consummating. And I'll just say from the lawyer standpoint, I think this is fine. I, I am not, um, I think there's a number of different terms that could be used. Uh, it could be like completed or um, take a, takes effect or something like that. Consummated is fine uh, if in fact, I also think that there are other terms, like if somebody's really trying to, 
uh, closed financing or something like that. Terminology is somewhat, uh, it's not set by statute. It's somewhat uh, substitutable here. So sure. like you could say, yeah, this is an agreement to complete XYZ financing. You haven't used the term executing, so you haven't, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not as worried about this either way. And so I'm fine if changing it to consummating will be clear, will be a clarifying change for some individuals in this field. I'm fine with that. Okay. Yeah. I'll take your advice on this one, David. All right. Yeah. On justice. <laughs> um, so then uh, the next comment is about social equity applicants and the changes of control. Basically, the recommendation is to update this section with parameters on transferring the licenses of social equity applicants that were recommended in the social equity report from the advisory committee. And as a reminder, this is just that uh, people are getting the benefits of a social equity license should not be able to retain those benefits if they are in fact, if they in fact no longer meet the qualifications to be a social equity applicant. And that is not explicitly provided for in this section. So do you know how to kind of update that? Essentially what it is is you isn't it if you transfer your business, if you're a social equity applicant and you've been receiving, you know, let's just say two years of benefits and reduced fees and you transfer your business and you have to pay back those those two years of benefits. Yes, yeah, and I think it shouldn't be too hard to. I think the the fee piece, yeah, it shouldn't be too hard to put that in. Yeah, it's just one more yeah. sub, subsection. Again. And to be clear, if you transfer to another social equity applicant, then you maintain you their maintain. their yeah. same kind of fee schedule. Mm -hmm. Yep. So then jumping ahead to rule 1.16, this is the cannabis and identification cards. There should be a requirement here or in rule two that employees, owners, or principals carry their ID cards at all times while on the license premise. This should be made explicit except for owners of home-based businesses and uh, retail, employees of retail establishments who enter the establishment off duty as a customer and do not access any area of the establishments, which is generally off limits to customers. I'm fine with that. I'm yeah, okay. My only thought was, do we need to be that specific? I guess we do. Probably didn't. helpful to okay. the establishment to have it in the rule. Yeah. Just yeah. Just we, asking. <laughs> <laughs> This makes more sense actually in rule two, which is the thing that governs what you do when you have a license. So we'll probably put it there, but I think we'll accept the recommendation and figure out the placement. Okay. As a draft change. Um, commenter notes that uh, in, uh, in light of pending legislation to allow employee portability of identification cards, the requirement in 1.16.3a that an applicant list the licensed cannabis establishment where the individual intends to work may be overly restricted. This should be drafted to accommodate a potential change. From the lawyer perspective, the drafting perspective, I think that's right. The intention here, originally drafting it, was to write language that would accommodate both the current statute and also a potential change in the statute. In other places, we have simply relied on the words of the statute without including it in the rule. I think we can just do that here. If the statute doesn't change, the statute still exists. People have to follow that. Our application process can accommodate that. Um, we don't need to say it here, and not saying it here allows for flexibility if the legislature makes a change. Okay. That's okay. Um, there should be a provision still in the same section. There should be a provision for a replacement process and for the final fate of the ID card. In terms of the final fate of the card, would it be sufficient to ensure the cards have expiration dates on them? Question mark. I think they should have expiration dates. Um, I would say final fate, you could destroy or send back to the board. Um, you know, give people an either or there. 
what would you want to set the expiration date? I mean, it's a adequate it's a two years. Yeah, it's two years that we've thought about. If it if the legislation changes the. It'll be yeah. We'll just rely on. We've already relied on the statute, and we'll continue to do that. Just say whatever the time period is in statute, and if it changes, changes. Do we want people to send them back to us if it's suspended or revoked before the expiration date? You know, it's just one of those things where we're not going to be able to really force someone to send it back. You know? Yeah. So we should just give them the option of send back or destroy. Okay. I mean, we could just say destroy, but. Yeah, send back or destroy either one. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. So then, this is a comment about the criminal history requirements, which largely, well, don't largely, they do track the uh, requirements for the application in general. Um, you don't want us to deal with replacement process. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> I would say whatever the DMV does for a driver's license is sufficient for me. I mean, I, the DMV, you know, I was just on their website. They just, this is a heavy fill. It's just like applying for a new one. Yeah. Or the first one. I'm fine with that. And you have to pay for it, right? There's no, there's no reduction in cost. No, yeah. yeah, you just pay for it. Right? Yeah. So just reapply, essentially. Is it a full reapplication? Except or? that, do we need to check their background again if they're replacing a lost card? If it's, if it's unexpired, not. I would say. Yeah. No. yeah. Okay, so re reapply, but no background check where it hasn't expired. Yeah. Anything else I've missed on this? Uh, they would they would still be under under the provision an employee that if they while they've reported their car lost, damage, or stolen, and they're reapplying, if they pick up a disqualifying criminal offense during that window, they would still be under a requirement to notify the board, I think. They're still essentially operating under their old license. What if someone loses a card and they're waiting for us to issue a new one? Still need to work? Get the temporary one, right? Is there one of those? Okay. Try There's keep like a temporary issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was making sure we had that. Yeah, the temporary ones essentially. Um, so there's a comment here that very much tracks the comment earlier about the criminal history background checks saying the same argument that it is overly restrictive. Uh, too many crimes are caught up in the net and presumes guilt. Um, and they don't uh, agree with needing to prove rehabilitation. Um, they ask that the CCB recognize that much of what is normally left up to the discretion of a business, like whom to hire and who's qualified, is substantially overseen by the CCB and requires processes and costs, like all the application costs. They note that that will be burdensome, and they urge the CCB to be permissive and understanding and supportive. Um, they do appreciate the allowance that the employee can work once the application has been submitted with the temporary ID card that we just mentioned. And that's basically the comment I you can discuss as, as you wish. I, I think it's uh, you were already discussed it largely in the prior piece. Yeah, so you can discuss it yeah. here. I mean, even compared to other licensed professions, this is way more permissive. The vast majority of Professions that are licensed by OPR don't allow felony convictions. Period. So, I think this. I think this one. Um, I think this one's sufficient, and it's now. It is very much narrowly tailored to achieve the purposes that were set out by the legislature around present threat to the market. So, agreed. The final comment here is just a drafting issue. Make sure the ID card is referenced using the same terminology in each instance. I. Agree with that drafting. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to do that. So that's the end of rule one. Um, how do people feel? <laughs> uh, I mean, we got a couple of options here. Um, one, we could carry on with rule two, keep going as long as we can. Maybe it's a four. 
Um, we could uh, pause for a public comment period and then go to rule two. Um, we could uh, go into executive session on the social equity criteria, or um, we could put that off to our next meeting um, because there might be other issues for executive session that come up. So how do you all feel? <laughs> David, why don't we start with you? I'm fine with whatever you yeah. all decide. I'm ready to keep going. And or I mean, you compiled the document for us. It seems to me, honestly, like rule two, there's actually more comments and more substance to get through um, than rule one. So I'm a little worried that we're going to be in the same predicament on Thursday if we don't do some more right now. Um, do you have a stop time? Four, four is in 45 minutes. I, I don't have I don't have a hard stop today, but okay. I know that, you know, we have other people that are helping us right now. That I'm, might, I'm fine to keep going as long as you want to keep going. I don't know how I just feel. I have a hard stop at four, but that's OK. okay. You guys can keep going without me. OK, why don't, how about we keep going in at four o'clock? We'll do our public comment and then we'll adjourn. Okay. So, moving on to rule two. Once again, starting with some general comments, these again were from our, our colleagues at Department of Agriculture, Food and Markets. One of these might have been a repeat, but I will just read it out here. For repeat being my fault, not their fault. I said it in two places. Uh, reporting to the board or requiring giving information to the board should generally only be required when it may trigger some action by the board. Otherwise, reporting is burdensome both for board and licensee without serving a purpose. Again, just a general thing the commenter wants us to keep in mind as we go through. If a cannabis establishment is required to report or take some action to alert the CCB of some occurrence, the CCB should be clear about what it will do with that information. If the CCB is not going to take an action or have a standard for enforcement for a breach, vehicle accident, diversion, theft, or loss at the point of the report, then it wouldn't be necessary to report. If at the end of the year a report is provided of a breach, vehicle accident, et cetera, and if it occurs three times in a year, you could outline consequences or that it weighs in on the CCB decisions in some way. So this is just saying these reports could be held by the establishment as opposed to the CCB. Um, also, the CCB may want to make the camp's establishment responsible for maintaining records rather than reporting incidents to the CCB unless warranted. This is very similar to the prior uh, comment and notes that um, the CCB will be responsible for managing those records reports in accordance with public records law. So what, what do you think about this just general comments, Julie and Kyle? I mean, what I started to do when I read this was started to go through and just highlight in rule one and two, anytime we require a report to us. Um, most of them are around issues like I picked up a criminal charge or I have a health and safety violation or, you know, but I take this to heart where it's kind of like, what are we going to do with this information? Um, and if, if the answer is we don't know, we'll wait and see, then um, you know, that's fine. But I, I do, you know, Stephanie just went through all this with him and I know it's not as detailed and it's not federally illegal, um, but uh, it is good advice. Yeah, no, I mean, Stephanie was on the, and I, and I know that there's some data collection stuff with respect to energy usage and water usage. And I think Stephanie and I wrestled over whether or not that was appropriate here to include and ask for. I want to track our, our climate impacts. And so we can get to that conversation when we get to specific usage. I mean, there's a argument to be made we have such small operators. I mean, unless you look at things in aggregate, how's it really? It's harder to track specifically those specific impacts. But we've also contemplated exempting 20 to 30 percent of market actors from those reporting requirements. So I'm like, how useful is the data? Missing a certain percentage of it to begin with. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like a internal struggle we need to figure out. I don't necessarily understand the perspective of if somebody if there is a theft or a breach or diversion how can we expect folks not to report that to us so i don't understand her comment or the purpose of her comment there yeah 
I think that's an important one for us to know with a federally illegal right. inventory tract uh, crop. Yeah, I mean, a vehicle accident, see that? Like there's, you know, yeah. I don't know if we need to get prescriptive on specific instances where we need to know as soon as possible considering things, you know, but. We may need to be more specific about like what kind of do we say in here what kind of vehicle accident so if i am a driver and i back into a curb and it damages the car do i need to report it to right. the ccb or if it's damage to the to the vehicle such that the cannabis is exposed to the outside or is on the ground or yeah, whatever or is that something that needs to be reported the car has to be towed to a line or right something or like there's that. an injury or something like yeah. that like is we may need to be specific about at what level we need the information well, I guess just in order to accommodate this comments, we should just look at any time it's said, you know, even do like a search and find, like report to the CCB or whatever, and, and just let's look look at them in the aggregate and see and just see if we we are being overly burdensome without much need for it. I don't think we can do anything right right here right now. Yeah, I mean it's hard to know in the, until we know specifically more how our enforcement team, wherever it's going to be, is going to look. You know what I mean? And you know, if you have a breach or a diversion, you report it to somebody, and we outline steps internally on how to handle certain things, right? But yeah. you know, still think just at the end of the year, oh, somebody stole pounds and pounds of weed from me, and understand how that's if that's the point she's trying to make. I don't get that. Uh, we would be comfortable making that something we would need to. Yeah. So for the special meeting on, I believe we said Thursday. Thursday. Right? Yeah. Would you want to just you as individual board members, just setting aside, I think you're clear on the safety and theft stuff. Mm -hmm. So setting that aside do some listing of the reporting and make some individual decisions about what you think is really needed. And then we can go through that as one of our. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Do it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's weird being at the beginning of a, of a program because I don't want people to give me data that we're not going to do anything with. But yeah. at the same time, we need to be able to track the, pro the progress of our programs. Again, I've said it before, the last thing I want is in five years, all the crosshairs to be on this industry as the big environmentally not conscious program within state government, you know? So you have to think about what it is we need and want to measure. Right. All right. All right. So jumping now to the more specific stuff, uh, going to the definition section, 2.1.3. Uh, first comment is really, I'd say, just a technical comment. We need to add the definitions of indoor and outdoor cultivation from rule one, because this rule relies on them too, understanding that those definitions have changed slightly based on. Okay. Second comment is to, uh, we had some, we had a couple of comments actually about defining harvest lot with more specificity. Well, or one comment said that specifically, the other comment said uh, it should be a single cultivar. Oh, that's I think that's my mistake, but a single canvas cultivar produced in a single season. Um, and then that the 0.9 testing requirements would be that you just test the harvest loss, which is harvest loss lots, which is already true. Um, I think the only difference with this commenter is saying that they would change the contiguous or they would eliminate the contiguous area piece of the harvest loss, harvest loss. I don't know why I can't say that word. It's, very, it's a three-letter <laughs> word. Harvest lot definition. Um, and just as an FYI, from the lawyer standpoint, this definition was taken directly from the current hemp rules that exist right now that the Ag Department of Ag is using right now. Um, because I think we anticipate Ag being a cooperative partner on this testing piece in particular, it made we thought it made sense to just use what they're already doing, especially because the labs they've certified use that already too. That's why it is what it is, but obviously those are the comments and you all should discuss what uh, what makes sense. I just have to assume that Ag went through rulemaking on this, probably has a reason why they chose this exact <laughs> definition. 
Um, and it's certainly, I don't have any real desire or even the expertise, honestly, to change it based upon this comment. I think, you know, folks are growing only one variety on a contiguous piece of land. I don't think it's necessary to test how certain things happen and happen. I'm happy with, I'm fine with this definition unless we hear through more comments or in conversations that we missed the mark. But, you know, whether it's one plant or 20,000 square feet, if it's the same variety or, you know, you're growing on the same land, you're, and you can't, it, it has to be a representative sample regardless. I think, I think, you know, that situation's not going to happen all too often. Yeah. Right. So uh, the next comment is about the greenhouse definition. Why 180 days? Is there an agricultural basis for this? Should it be shorter? The answer is yes, there's an agricultural basis for it. I don't think it needs to be shortened right. or adjusted. I mean, this is trying to folks that are growing outdoors, but in the context of a greenhouse erected specifically for cannabis production, I mean, it's going to take six months to grow and harvest your crop. And that was the how we drew the line between Greenhouses and hoop houses that are not exempt that are exempt from you know specific energy yeah. requirements. And you got this definition. You just added uh, a little bit to it, right? It said, yeah. It said uh, initially, like, and it's it's taking from other uh, commercial um, energy use standards across yes. the country. It said erected, and we didn't want folks to think that it said erected for you know vegetative use or something like that. I think. We were nervous that the term erected might mean folks need to take fundamentally take this down every season and some hoop houses you drive around i mean yeah. they're still standing you know mine is in my backyard you know so um we just put in, in continuous cannabis production i think is what it says so i think the definition is exactly where it needs to be right uh skipping ahead to 2.2 which is the regulations applicable to all cannabis establishments um we had a couple of comments that were all in the nature of saying that, hey, actually, not all of these are applicable to all cannabis establishments. In particular, uh, folks pointed out that not all of these are going to be applicable to labs. And uh, one commenter had a number of sections. I, I won't read out that whole list, but they had a number of sections saying that these specifically aren't really applicable to labs. Uh, somebody else noted that a chunk of the section actually seems to focus on retail. Um, I think to some degree, those are fair comments. I would, I mean, I'd, I'd leave it up to the board. I think one drafting possibility is to just note that um, really just to change the beginning here and note that uh, these could be applicable <laughs> to most cannabis establishments. And I don't know, again, I'm thinking out loud to my detriment, but I think there could be <laughs> Uh, a way of just saying, look, these are generally applicable. They may not be applicable to every cannabis establishment, but these are generally applicable. Applications. My worry about trying to sift them more precisely is that anytime you say, all right, well, this is a, applicable to three out of the five, are you, we now going to drop those into three different places yeah. elsewhere? And I think it just becomes much longer and messier. So I'd rather finesse this by changing essentially what we call the section, really. And then operate to operationalize that once people get into their application, it's only going to ask them for the things that they or once we sorry, we've moved on from rule one. <laughs> <laughs> but once we they they will only need to keep track of the things that they know that they need to keep track of, like we'll have guidance on the types of things that they need to keep track of and the records that they need to have. I think that's right. I think as we get sort of more and more mature in how we're operating, there can be guidance that is specific to each. Yeah type of establishment that will be very clear about what they need to pay attention to and uh, i think that'll help but yeah i think the i'd recommend that the solution be that we sort of change how we describe this section instead yeah. of real yeah okay. that's fine with me i mean for instance and notice in the comment also just like uh are we really going to require a visitor log for a retail establishment you know i don't think that that's really required any in any other jurisdiction right you're just writing down everyone who comes in and out every customer 
I don't think people want that. No. <laughs> I mean, we've said specifically, I think, you know, it, they can check your name and birthday yeah. on your license, but they can't ask for anything else like right. email and stuff unless you expressly give it right. to them for purposes of emailing you. Say, you know, educational material. Sure. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to opt into that. You know what I mean? Right. So. Like any other business. It sounds like David, you know how to kind of hopefully <laughs> <laughs> make sure we're collecting the right stuff from the right people and not collecting stuff we don't need from yeah if it looks like this is going to be a mess and we need to delineate it further i'll come back to you on thursday and okay you know. um so moving on to some more specific stuff here oh yeah one more on this sort of generally this is you've already dealt with this but put all comments, sub, different substantive comments in here. Uh, the comment that potency for cannabis products should be limited to 15%. We can just refer to our January 15th report or our November 1st report. Okay. Yeah, right. And you issued a statement at some point as well. Okay. I think we've spent enough time on that issue at yeah. this point. Yep. Great. Going to 2.2.1 business records. Uh, there is a couple comments on here. So let me, um, this the section requires that voluminous business records be maintained on site by a licensee, potentially creating significant paper and storage issues. Additionally, subpart F requires maintenance of seed to sale tracking records, which may be unnecessary given that the board is likely to require a centralized system wherein such records would be maintained centrally, and subpart M requires maintenance of application records, copies of which the board will necessarily already have. Recommendations from the commenter state that um, it allow the on-site requirements to be satisfied by maintaining records, such records digitally, including on a cloud-based storage platform, so long as the records can be readily made available for inspection by the board. Similar adjustments should be made to 2.6.6 sub A and 2.8.5. Any other Where do we say that? Where do we say anything about paperwork storage? Yeah, we don't, but maybe it just needs to. Okay, that sounds good. I will. Uh, clarify. The license is not going to be a paper application, so. I'll clarify accordingly with digital, including cloud based is fine. <laughs> really, it just needs to be accessible. Right. From, yeah. Uh, so I was thinking it's just like readily accessible. Yeah, that's a good. I'll say do something along the lines of readily accessible from the location of the. Must be maintained in a readily accessible fashion, or something like that. Pull up the PDF on your computer if we need it. You know. Pretty say readily accessible. Yeah, we'll just yeah. say readily. We can just delete on site and yeah, records readily accessible. Anyway. <laughs> Don't need to do that now. Um, going to the next. I'm fine with, you know, I know we don't know what system we're using, but I kind of agree that seed to sale tracking records are probably duplicative. People have to kind of like download them and keep them um, as opposed to just kind of, and we already say kind of inventory records mm -hmm. separately. So you're saying you're agreeing with deleting, deleting F. F? I don't know. I'm fine with that. I think we just need to make a note of when we, you know, I know that we have staff working on, you know, inventory tracking now and yeah. whether it's making sure we understand exactly how those records are kept right. in, for, from all the conversations we have through the RFP process, or we at least ask it and make sure it's good to go before we as a board, you know, move in a specific direction, you know. And then the other recommendation here is to delete subsection M about the license application records. Yep. Right. All right, so then we have another comment here. Uh, the list could be divided into categories, and there could be some internal references to the sections of the rule that further lay out expectations for required records, contents of the records, and um, sorry, I just thought of a different issue. Well, essentially, um, sorry, go ahead, Pepper. Just that this to me really comes down to what's best for our compliance and enforcement folks. So 
I would say that either Bryn should weigh in on this or Kimberly or someone that is going to have to deal kind of accessing these records. So I tuned out. Sorry. Bryn, <laughs> I'm doing important so work over here. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, where are we? I'm working on something else, so I'm a little behind. So the business records should be divided into categories. Um, based on their contents. All right. Signature pages. Is this is just oh, sorry, go ahead. how this is drafted? I I don't understand the I don't think I understand what the what this is really getting at. Yeah, I feel like to some degree this is this would be good direction for the licensees to follow. I'm not sure it's necessary for us to delineate this. What we care about is being able to make sure these are accessible. Right. And as long as we can get them, and accessible obviously means that they are in some sort of order that an inspector can right. read and understand. So, yeah, I don't know if we need to if we need to do this so much as this is a good idea for licensees to. I agree with that. I think that is. Um, I think it's important to keep them accessible and in a way that can easily be um, understood by our inspection staff. <laughs> Other than that, Storm, I need to. Then on the same section 2.2.1, but specifically G, commenter notes that this needs to carve out retailers, as this is not required for retailers. And they're talking about visitor logs. Um, so you feel like you can draft this in a way that 2.2 generally in a way that kind of makes those. Like I think so, although for this one, because there is a pretty direct conflict here, in other words, a lot of this stuff just doesn't apply. So for that, you just say, look, where it's applicable, it applies. This one, there's more of a direct conflict saying you should do this in one place. You don't have to do it in another place. So I think for this one, I will specific, or I would recommend that we specifically note that retailers are not required. I don't think we need to say that where visitors aren't permitted. It's just like, right, that's more of like a, there is a first well, issue. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Um, moving on to 2.2.2, a number, uh, or no, one, yeah, one comment about the insurance issue. Coverage, the coverage limits, 1 million for occurrence, 2 million, I agree, and alternative bond requirements, 250,000 are too high for smaller operations, such as some tier two manufacturers, tiers one through three cultivators, seeds and clones retailers, and unknown potential future license types. The recommendations that, within, that are within this comment are that we should replace the strict coverage limits of the requirement to maintain commercially reasonable levels of insurance commensurate with the licensee's quantum of risk while maintaining the 1 million slash 2 million occurrence aggregate minimum for larger operations such as full retailers, wholesalers, tier one manufacturers, high tier cultivators, and then reduce the alternative bond amount for smaller operations to 50,000. I'm fine with that, honestly. I've never. I never liked that we just picked a number here. I know I was the one that suggested these numbers. Um, but I do just kind of like commercially appropriate amounts. Mm -hmm. um, right. So then it's a conversation between the insurance company or agent yeah. and the business yeah. to determine what's appropriate. More tailored to so your business. Yeah. The insurer is going to know better than we know. Right. Do we want to spell out the specifics for the larger operations, or do we just want to leave it at what's reasonable? I think we leave it at what's reasonable. Yeah, it's fine by me. Are yeah. there are there kind of fly by night insurance companies that will insure someone unreasonably? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> They're always. Yeah. Well, we don't have to worry about that because. I mean, to some degree, like you can't manage every yeah. aspect okay. of the risk that these folks are going to face. They're going to okay. have to make some due diligence themselves. To... But we don't want to just say, like, leave the one to two million in aggregate for the tiers that are being suggested here. Well, and there are other pieces, right? But so, you know, I would imagine that finances are going to want to see what level of business insurance there is, right? right? So those conversations happen in a different okay. part of the market. All right. So we'll just say, Commercially reasonable levels of insurance. 
And I think reasonable does give you some hook if you see somebody buying a thousand dollars worth of insurance to ensure their whole operation. Okay. That's enough for you to say that's just not reasonable. You never know what's up. Then the other part of this comment, though, is about the bond, which is, is separate. Bond, yeah. yeah. So we did 10,000 for tier one cultivators. Yep. As I recall. Yep. Um, so 50,000 for others. Does that seem right? For everybody else? Well, no, I think we would want to, if, if we're going to, I think we would want to graduate it more than that. Okay. So, um, hey, take a number out of that. I know, it doesn't feel right. I mean, you could just do the same delineation that's in the recommendation, which is, yeah, the, the high folks, the full retailers, wholesalers, tier one, tier four to six cultivators all do the 250. Everybody else does 50 except the people who do 10 they already carved out. Yeah. I realize that's also picking numbers, but yeah, here we are. Okay. Why don't we do it that way for now? Just and then we can revisit this on Thursday if we feel like we need to. Do we know um, if banks will open escrow accounts for cannabis establishments? Yeah, it's on my list to, to ask. Again, I assume that they do, but you never really want to assume. So jumping up to rule 2.2.4, health, safety, and sanitation requirements. Somebody notes that the final sentence is overly burdensome if read to require the CCB to enforce other agencies or rules. I would just say from the lawyer perspective, um, I don't think that that is what that sentence does. Uh, it's the purpose of that sentence is to be is to send a signal should other agencies need it that um, they are not responsible for enforcing our recommendations. In other words, not saying that we're going to enforce theirs, but that they don't have to enforce ours. And other agencies are eager to have language like that because other agencies depend on federal dollars that could be in jeopardy if they are seen to be dealing with cannabis. 100% agreed. I think, it's, um, I think it's important for folks to understand that there might be more state agencies at play depending on your situation right. than us, right. you know? Right. And it's not to say that they won't. <laughs> they right. probably will in right. a number of cases, but just most cases, but just leaving, giving them that sort of protection. Um, and then here we are again. This is the report issue, um, which I think I'm going to leave for now because we already decided that you're going to go through and make your own individual assessments about reports, and we'll come back on that. So let's let's set that aside and come back to that next time. Going to 2.2.5 A, said the recommendation notes that this provision provides that all agents of those who control a licensee complete an enforcement seminar every three years, which seems to encompass investors with no operational involvement in business. The recommendation of the commenter is to limit the scope of this to those control persons who have significant operational roles within the licensee including any members of the licensee's board of directors or similar governing body. Um, and just to note, this is in part a statutory requirement, but the commenter is correct that agents of those who control, I don't believe the statutory language. Let me just pull that up. But so in other words, you do have the flexibility to do what is being recommended here the the statute says a licensee shall complete and because a licensee could be so many different you know, what is the licensee it can be this entity that who are we talking about when we right. say licensee there has to be a real human being in order to make this a real um requirement and that was the attempt to do that but i think there are commenters correct in terms of broad statement that could be narrow to make it more effective Yeah. 
We like we like that recommendation. Mm -hmm. All right, pretty nice. Here. <laughs> And then another commentator noted that subsection A says training requirements are every three years, but B says training requirements annual, and then the commenter says everything should be annual. Again, subsection A was um, following to some degree, only not entirely as we just covered, but was, was following statute, section 865A, which does require a three-year enforcement seminar, or I should say an enforcement seminar every three years. Yeah. Obviously, you know, the board could go above that if you wanted. That would be still within the statute to do so, but it's up to you if you want to do that. You don't have to do that. I really feel like every three years is probably enough. I, yeah, I mean, this isn't, this is just the enforcement section. Yeah. But, um, I mean, the, the problem, of course, is that rules are going to change every year, so. But you know what? I'm fine with it. It was every three years. Why are we second guessing the wisdom of the world? Huh. All right. Um, moving to 2.2.5 employment and training. Uh, commenter says several of the training topics seem irrelevant to employees of licensees other than retailers as well as non-customer facing employees of retail licensees. So the commenter recommends a few different things here. Um, and they are one, limit subdivision two, uh, we're talking about uh, section B of 2.2.5 here. Limit subdivision two to customer facing employees of retail, oh sorry, not just two, my apologies. Two, seven, eight and eight to customer facing employees of retailers um, allow a waiver of four for any licensee which does not intend to allow customers or visitors to access the licensed premises limit six to employees of retailers and limit 10 to employees with management responsibilities you can take those one at a time wherever you want to okay with the first recommendation I'm um, okay with the second. Suppose I'm okay with the third. And I don't know about the last one. So the third, um, I guess I don't know enough about how like a cultivator or a manufacturer will do business and whether or not they'll be cash. Or a wholesaler. Or a wholesaler. It's going to be managing a lot of product and money. Potentially. We don't know how much of a cash business this is going to be through every yeah. part of the supply chain. So that's my only hesitation okay. there. And then the last one, I mean, I really don't think it's that overly burdensome to do diversity, equity, inclusion training. Yeah, I'm cool with the first two. First two being retail specific, the last two being everybody specific. All right. We have a feeling at least somewhat that we will be providing those trainings to some extent, as in like a video. That people can watch. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I, you I just, sign it up for it? No, I just, uh, <laughs> the reason I ask is, you know, again, I think on a lot of this stuff, uh, if we don't provide it, it in some ways, it's an additional burden on the employees. You know, again, yeah. the establishment is not going to be paying for it because these yeah. people are not tied to an establishment or they won't be, hopefully. So, um, you know, having them sign up for 12 different trainings. No, could I think expensive. you could do it in one afternoon. Yes. Okay. Yeah. On one day or whatever. Yep. Okay. All right. We got 10 minutes left, David. All right. Let's see what we can do. 2.2.6 tracking of cannabis and cannabis products. The first comment asks Is there a difference between seed to sale tracking and inventory tracking? Um, the answer is in the defined terms of this statute. The inventory tracking system is. Um, or I should say inventory tracking system is a defined term. And it is, is it? I thought it was. There it is. Um, inventory tracking system means a method implemented by the board for tracing all cannabis and cannabis products grown, manufactured, and sold in Vermont. So I'll say that speaking broadly, 
yes, it's the same thing, but it's defined in a way that could accommodate a variety of different sort of specific programs that the board may contract with, which as I think folks know is undecided at the moment. Um, so I don't know if you want to do anything with that, but that's just a sort of explanation for the question. Is there a difference between that and seed to sale? Should we just call it inventory tracking throughout? Um, I believe, did, is, is seed to sale in there? We did the just record. eliminate it as one of the business records. Seed to sale tracking. Yeah, record. you're right. So it should have, that is an, a drafting error. And thank you for catching. It should be that um, everything is noted as inventory tracking system okay. instead of seed to sale. I'll, I'll do a search to make sure that we do get rid of all the references. Okay. Um, it should all be inventory tracking system, but yeah, speaking broadly without getting too technical, it's the same thing. Yep. Um, what does it mean to have another commenter asked, what does it mean to have the inventory tracking system readily available to the public? This is a reference to the end of subsection A and it says the inventory tracking system policy shall be readily available to the public. What that means is that there will be further detail spelled out about exactly what's being tracked, where it's being tracked and so forth. That's going to be in policy. We're saying in rule, you have to have it. In yeah. policy, we're going to lay out more detail. So the policy will be readily available to the public. Everybody knows what we're doing with that. So it's not saying that the exact information is readily available. It's just that the information about the system itself right. will be readily available. And it's the board's policy, That's not true. the establishment's policy. Yeah, and and yeah, and to be clear, certainly the inventory tracking data will be something that will be confidential under the statutory requirements. Okay. Great. In some section F, um, should cannabis the commenter says should cannabis establishments be responsible for training employees to ensure the accuracy of the information entered into the tracking system? Yeah, commenter says I'm not sure that individuals should be held accountable. It sounds like a personnel issue rather than a regulatory issue. Uh, and that's a reference to the fact that that provision says cannabis establishments and the individuals using the inventory tracking system are responsible for the accuracy of all information entered into it. Any misstatements or omissions may be considered a license violation affecting public safety. Um, I mean, I, I can see the ambiguity there, and I think we are generally enforcing against establishments, but we could make that clearer if but doesn't this also kind of say that if you're an individual that's actively misusing it, your employee ID card might be suspended or revoked also? Yeah, I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember us having a conversation where there's other jurisdictions, I think, where only the owner operator could enter this, which meant that person had to be in this establishment yeah. every single day in practice, right? So I think we allowed some employees to take on this responsibility as part of their job. But yeah, I mean, your employee ID card, if you're intentionally misrepresenting sales and diverting, like I still think it is a regulatory issue, not just a personnel issue, because we don't know where that product's going. Yeah. Does that statement capture it though? They, any misstatements or omissions may be considered a license violation affecting public safety. Does that capture the employee ID card issue? I think so. Let me check. Oh, let me check the rule 1.16. Okay. To make sure that we've captured that as we need to in terms of why a license could be. I think in rule four, it's probably covered anyway. But I think both places. Yeah. I'll just check to make sure we have something there. And then the next comment is really um, about the drafting issue, which I don't feel strongly about it. Saying that C and G kind of are similar and could either be combined or could go one right after the other. Um, and I'm fine either way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you folks think. <laughs> I, don't, I can see the point. I mean, I guess they are similar. And they could be put in the same spot. Sticky tech, but uh, yeah, I'm not super worried about this. I say just move them to like sequentially. Okay, it helps move people them closer read. to one another. It helps right. people read and understand it, I guess. Sure. Okay. 
Um, oh, we have got a couple more on this too. Um, on 2.2.6 C, it, the commenter asked, do cultivators need to track all plants with seed to sale, even those that never make it to market? Can plants that die be tracked another way or will they be tracked in the seed to sale system? Um, and this is kind of an operational question, I think, as much as it is a, a legal or rule question. But my understanding had been that um, everything is tracked. If something doesn't make it, that is noted in the tracking. So I think we actually talked about this last time, didn't we? We talked about disposal. Yeah. Um, but no, I think there will be an opportunity to, depending on the system that we use, enter in some way a plant that hasn't made it to market. It's, it's, it's you know, accounted for. Let's try to do, I think we can do one more, maybe two more. Um, 2.2.6 E, somebody notes that, um, or asks, what will the audit add to the seed to sale tracking that is already required? If an audit is needed, what does comprehensive annual audit mean? So this is language that came directly out of Massachusetts, um, possibly New Jersey as well. So I'll just take a second look to see if that's defined anywhere. And then maybe I can talk to Jen Flanagan about what they do with these annual audits. And we did waive this, right, for tier one cultivators. No. I don't have that document in front of me at the moment. No, okay. I think so. Maybe it was on my list to waive, but maybe we decided not to. I don't have it. But I'll, I'll talk to Jen before Thursday. Just ask her about this. Yeah, how burdensome it is. What, what it could is it's different than seed to sale track. Uh, I think we can sneak in one more here, real quick. Um, this is sort of talking about both 2.2.6 and 2.2.7 and like the commercial realities of how products going to go back and forth. And it's more of a, as much of a question as anything, I think. As a processor of products for other Vermont companies, I'd like to see clear rules on tracking and transferring of distillate. Some of these Vermont brands use their oil in our products and they are returned to the company for distribution. I know they want this to happen in the rec market as well. I'd like to see more clarification on this process and understanding from the board members about the chain of, and I think I might mean custody, chain of custody of oil slash distillate and transferring the finished product that is intended to be packaged and distributed by them. Will we need to pro package in the processing facility? Does it matter if there are documentation and manifests? If we could clarify this. And, you know, I think the, speaking from my understanding of what we've constructed here, but you should weigh in after that. Um, all the product is gonna have to be tracked going back and forth, but it doesn't prevent this exact type of commercial right. activity from happening. You certainly can go back and forth in terms of handling the same stuff, if that makes sense commercially for what you're doing. But yes, it does have to be tracked and documented. That's my understanding, but fill me in if I'm missing something here. No, I mean, my understanding is, you know, it's not gonna be a linear supply chain. Things are gonna be moving forwards and backwards and upwards and downwards, you know? <laughs> so, Shell Silverstein style, but you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. I that's Roald Dahl, actually. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Okay. And I think our rules are pretty clear about chain of custody. Right. Transportation manifests. Uh, this is essentially could be white labeling, right? Right. right. Into yeah. this, which is a question that's in here later. And again, I think once people, you know, we don't know what tracking system we're going to go with, but I think once people have that more of a tangible product that they can kind of see and interact with, some of those questions will be answered in due time, you know. Yeah. I think it makes sense to stop there because the next, we're almost at four and the next one is really all about, the next set of um, comments is all about we are transportation. transportation. So it makes sense just to do that as a chunk when we get back together. That sounds great. Well, thank you, David and Bryn. Long as a, uh, Whirlwind. Um, all right. Well, the only thing left on our schedule today um, is public comment. So thank you to the folks that stuck with us. Um, we'll start with the.
people that join via the link. Um, if you have a comment, please raise your virtual hand and we'll start with uh, David Silverman. Hey, uh, just uh, want to say you guys are beasts. Uh, it's uh, quite a slog <laughs> today and uh, <laughs> really appreciate it. That's all. Thanks. Well, thanks for the comments, David. It's uh, It's been helpful to kind of have you look through these with your, you know, detailed eye. Um, next uh, is Dan. Thank you guys again. I know it's been a long day, so I'll be uh, quick. I just wanted to go through some notes and uh, from the conversation today, I think it's a great idea uh, to allow hoop houses with minimal supplemental lighting to be considered outdoor. The suggestion to make it more official that it is outdoor is to make that lighting be seasonal um, only to prolong vegetative space in between crops if people are doing light deprivation. And you may want to include that the lights need to be either LEDs or compact fluorescence. Um, and the six watts per square foot is ideal. In California, there's currently people pushing for that to be considered outdoor instead of mixed light. So uh, thank you guys for that. Um, next, I would like to say as far as the plant count versus the canopy square footage, um, in regards to R&D, I just wanted to make a point that a lot of people doing research and development, exploring through genetics may need to grow out larger plant populations and have larger plant density, but with much smaller plants. And so that's just another example and a reason why I think that it makes sense to measure all cultivation based off of uh, canopy square footage rather than plant count. Um, I also want to say that your decision regarding uh, getting rid of the nursery licensing and allowing cultivation to just have something in there that says cultivators can sell plants and seeds to other licensed cultivators and retails. I would like to say thank you. I think that is a great idea. It's going to make a lot of people's lives easier and I'm very thankful that you guys made that decision. And my very last comment is about uh, the property span numbers. Um, it's kind of a question, what happens if someone has two adjacent parcels or they bought one large parcel, but it consists of multiple span numbers, even though they're all considered one property or one mortgage? You know, would people be able to have a cultivation site on one garden or the other? Or what about adjacent properties under the same ownership with maybe one neighbor in between or something like that, but, you know, with cultivation for the same license? Great. We'll, um, we will take that into consideration. Um, and again, that was a request from the Department of Tax. Thank you. Um, yep. Uh, Amelia. Happy Monday, guys. You guys really are troopers. I get to do this from my couch in my pajamas, and y'all have to dress up and go out in public to do this. So I, I definitely <laughs> applaud you. Um, to kind of bounce off what Dan said, um, I understand and appreciate the reasoning behind getting rid of the nursery license. Um, I get it, but I would caution that by putting the burden of uh, growing clones for sale or for breeding um, under the same license as cultivation, what's gonna end up happening is people who want to breed genetics um, for their cultivation license are going to have to sacrifice a piece of their canopy to do it, um, or it's going to force them to go into a higher tier than they initially wanted to, as opposed to getting a nursery license on top of their cultivation license. Um, and the, the only way I see that being a, a big threat is if somebody has a tier one cultivation license and they have to dedicate a portion of their canopy to breeding or growing clones for supplemental income in between harvests, it could push them up into tier two and they would lose a lot of their tier one exemptions. Uh, so that's just something to think about. I appreciate you guys. Have a good day. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, Carolyn P. Hi, thanks for taking my comment. Uh, thanks for all your work as well. Um, I just wanted to comment about the span number as well. Um, I personally have a property that is divided by rivers and roads, and it's all one property, but three different span numbers. I'm not necessarily sure that I would grow on any on all 
three different um, parcels, even though they're one parcel. <laughs> Um, but just letting you know it could uh, inhibit somebody. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Um, anyone else who joined by the link, um, feel free to just raise your hand. Otherwise, um, we have one person who joined by phone. Um, I'll give that person who joined by phone just a quick opportunity. Tito, I did see your hand go up, but just if the person who joined by phone wants to make a comment, feel go ahead. OK, um, I saw you on mute, but maybe that was just a coincidence. Tito? Hey, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to share a quick public service announcement um, through my um, my journey of uh, converting a building to my new grow to my two tier cultivation uh, enterprise that um, the commercial building energy standards turns out it actually only applies to new construction, um, even if it's in an old building. So in other words, if you're opening up some walls or anything you're opening up, then you would have to meet those 2020 building standards. Uh, but it uh, turns out if you're not opening anything up that you don't. So that that is a really big deal um, that I've been talking about for a while. So I just wanted to say how that uh, turns out. It's not so bad. Thank you. That's good to hear. Um, great. Um, so anyone else who'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. Um, I'll just give it a few seconds here. I don't see anyone. All right. Well, um, that's all that we have on our on our agenda. So again, um, we're going to try, I think, our best to get through these uh, the rest of the these comments on Thursday. Um, if it's anything like today, we might need a little extra time, so maybe Friday. Um, but um, again, just before we leave, we have our public comment uh, meeting tomorrow, um, six to seven.